So this is an opening gala. We are calling it a gala because a uh, simply event wasn't festive enough. We also wanted to make a little joke or association to Met Gala because this is how we see it. Festive, fun, and kind of special. Um, we'll have a great lineup uh, throughout these two days and all the materials uh, will be made available. We also have a medium publication. So if you look for Digital Storytelling Festival, Europeana, the Heritage Lab on Medium, this is where you can access much more information, including the tools and open licensed collections. So those two days will be packed with knowledge, but beyond there are also ways to continue learning and exploring. So um, the festival uh, is brought to you by Europeana and the Heritage Lab, which are um, two organizations passionate uh, about bringing culture to people in a digital way. And last year, still in the pandemic, we thought that we should maybe do something interesting for um, cultural heritage professionals um, to help them, yeah, in these difficult times, maybe learn something, maybe boost their skills, but also get inspired. And last year we started small just to see whether the concept will work. Uh, we had two interns who as digital natives helped us with uh, working with different tools. We featured some open collections and we received a lot of nice feedback. And we noticed that while digital is often seen in terms of data sets, collections, content, material. This is how it's called and being referred to. The way people share the world, uh, explore it, connect are actually stories. And this is way older than digital. And this is how our brains are still wired because everything that you see on your computer, it's very, very new comparing to the history of the world. We also noticed that storytelling goes way beyond cultural heritage industry, but cultural heritage content can be interesting for people working in many different jobs and in many different areas. And it's also something that can make your life richer and bring you perspective. So we would like to, to explore the ways to tell stories, but also explore cultural heritage, which is available to you openly and to see the richness of the collections across the world, which can be used and uh, told stories with. So a very important ingredient of this whole festival is you because your lived experience, your knowledge, your style, the way you express yourself makes you unique. And this makes your story unique. So um, we'd like to, to take advantage of that and not to be perfect, but to be you. But as we are all different, coming from different places, expressing us ourselves in different ways. We would also like to bring your attention that the space that we are creating for these two days should be safe. This is very important and nurturing. So to be very clear about it, because being clear is something that in storytelling and in communication is crucial. Uh, we have some inclusive engagement guidelines for you. And I would like you to take a look at them so that we can learn, we can have a great event on today's, uh, but also 
don't forget about kindness and compassion. So we would like you to listen and read with the same energy as you would like to be heard. Um, embrace the learning mindset, be aware of your own biases. There will be different topics that different people will react to differently, but uh, stay curious. If you don't understand, ask. Uh, there will be ways to explore and there will be also ways to discuss while uh, remaining respectful. Um, there are different points of view and this is something that is beautiful about big events where people from everywhere can join and this is also beautiful about storytelling because the sum of all the stories shows the plurality of the world and history and the future that we are sharing. Uh, nobody is perfect, we are not perfect and you are not as well. So we all, we all will own the errors that we make. If it's necessary, we will apologize, make amends and try to fix it and remain open and positive. And if your boundary is closed, crossed, it's okay to speak up. So I hope in this way, we'll be able to communicate openly and with compassion and kindness in the coming two days and plenty of events. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers, inspiring sessions, and there will be ways to interact. So when interacting, there are two ways you can do it. There is a Q&A section in which you can ask the questions to presenters and about the content of the sessions. They will be answered either during the session, either directly in the Q&A section or by the speakers in the Q&A slot of the session. If there is no time, we'll do our best to provide the answer afterwards in writing. So please keep on asking questions. We really love to receive them and we love when people are interested, engaged and curious. Um, during, when you close the Zoom window, there will be a feedback, short questionnaire. And we are a small team doing our absolute best to deliver beautiful and meaningful events for you. But as I said before, no one and nobody is perfect. And what helps to improve is feedback. So when you close the window and see a little questionnaire pop up, please give your answers. We would love to hear from you. And we would love to improve for the next edition of this event, but also all the future events we organize. And when you just want to interact during the session, comment, share your opinion, there is a chat, see it as a way to connect with other people and mingle. So this is it for the short intro and housekeeping. And now my co-organizer Medavi will tell you a little bit about the program. Thank you so much, Alex, and welcome everybody to yet another year of the Digital Storytelling Festival. We are really excited to bring the second edition because it's uh, somewhat been somewhat different and uh, we're excited to see um, your feedback and what you create during this year. Um, so this year too, just like the last year, we'd like to explore what good digital storytelling looks like, uh, what a good story can really do and what it takes to tell one. Um, over the next few days, uh, you'll meet a host of speakers. Um, our sessions will cover storytelling tips across formats, um, from video storytelling and um, online exhibition creation, social media, gifts and memes, yes. Um, you'd hear from incredible and really inspiring uh, storytellers, aside from the European team, who will have uh, the digital storytelling tips and the workshops starting today for you. Uh, this year, we also have introduced a very special component. Uh, it's the Pecha Kucha component. 
the format goes that there'll be 20 slides and each slide would uh, be about 20 seconds. And these sessions would be hosted during the lunch break. Uh, so spend a little time uh, just when the sessions, the main sessions close, you will see some speakers presenting uh, some of the most amazing stories that they've created. We had a lot of interest in Tessa Puja sessions, but we also decided to share some of the best ones that we thought you'd be interested in. So make sure that during the lunch break, you're seeing these video sessions. It would be very encouraging for the creators as well. And if you have an idea for a Pecha Kocha session, you know how to apply next year, right? So uh, without uh, further ado, I'm just going to hand over to my co-organizer, Douglas, and he'll take you through how you can participate and um, how the festival goes after the next two days. Thanks, Madhavi, and welcome, everybody. Great to have you with us today. Um, we're really looking forward to this year's Digital Storytelling Festival and the next two days of this opening gala. So as Alex and Madhavi introduced so beautifully, um, we have a really packed program of uh, workshops, uh, some practical tips, and particularly today, some inspiring case studies around digital storytelling and how it relates to cultural heritage. So we really hope and we're confident uh, that you will find uh, a lot of things to take away that you can apply in your own creative projects, perhaps in your own work. And uh, this will really kind of boost your excitement about cultural heritage and how it can be used to create stories that connect your interests, your creativity, and the world that we live in today. As Madhavi mentioned, the, uh, the full information about the Storytelling Festival, which opens today at this gala, is available on the Medium publication, Digital Storytelling Festival. And perhaps one of my colleagues will drop in a link into the chat, just for your ease of reference. And the festival this year runs from today until the 12th of June. Full details about how it works, um, what you need to do if you want to submit an entry for the festival uh, are on the Medium publication. But we can say that there are prizes, who doesn't love a prize? And we have, as last year, we have uh, two different uh, processes of judging the, the most popular and best, the highest quality stories which are submitted. We have a people's choice vote, which everyone is welcome here today uh, during the festival to vote for by liking the stories which are published onto Medium in, in the next few weeks. And we also have a fresh jury, three expert professionals around storytelling from cultural heritage and also beyond. And they will be uh, working hard. We've given them lots of homework to do, to review, to assess, to discuss amongst themselves and to rate the, their favorite and what they think are the best, most interesting uh, stories, which are submitted during the festival and are eligible for prizes, which, and there are runners up prizes too. So uh, look out for more information about that on Medium. So today marks the opening of the festival. We're absolutely thrilled to have you with us. Um, as Alex and Madhavi said, feel free, very welcome throughout the day and of course tomorrow to drop your thoughts, your reflection into the chat. We and our colleagues will be monitoring that closely and taking note to, to what you have to say. And we also have Q&A that you can use directly to uh, pose questions for the speakers as we go through this session. So without further ado, let's get this gala started. I'm very proud and happy to introduce my colleague at Europeana, Beth Daly. She's our editorial advisor Hi, Beth, welcome. And she is a, a creative writer in her own right. Uh, Beth has many inspiring and, uh, perspectives and tips and ideas to share with you. So um, we really think that you're going to love this session. It's all about how to release your inner storyteller. So without further ado, Beth, thank you. Welcome. And I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Doug. What a lovely introduction. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. And I think I've got control of the screen. 
let me just see. Yes, excellent. So welcome everybody. And uh, what better way to sort of start the program of the Digital Storytelling Festival than having a go and having a workshop and getting over that blank page straight away. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. Um, and I'm going to introduce myself a little bit more just on the next slide. But whilst I do that, I wonder, um, I know lots of you introduced yourself in the chat already. If you haven't, please do so now. But also, please can you put in the chat uh, your favourite word or a favourite word, a word that you like. And there is a reason for this, which I'll come to later on. But just for now, while I'm introducing myself, give me a word that you like in the chat. OK. OK, so here I am again. You can see me twice on the screen at once. How lovely. So I'm editorial advisor at the Europeana Foundation. And what that means is that I help engage a broad range of audiences in Europeana's work and content. And I particularly focus on things like Europeana's tone of voice and style and messaging. So I'm trying to ensure that Europeana always communicates with a consistent tone of voice and that what we say is consistent across all our communications. And I support my colleagues colleagues in developing their understanding of that through you know skills development workshops that kind of thing and to develop their own writing skills too and in 2020 to 2021 I ran a task force um, on Europeana and storytelling and I will be telling you about one of the, its outcomes shortly so on the creative front I have a PhD in creative writing um, and as a result of that I published a novel Blood and Water which I'm very proud of um, and I also run writing workshops and do a bit of writing coaching on a freelance basis. So I'm quite an advocate, really, of practicing creative writing, both for its own sake, um, I love it, and for what it can bring to your professional writing and professional processes. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, too. So today, what are we going to do in the next hour? My aim is to increase your confidence in writing creatively and have a bit of fun. So whether you write every day already, and this is something that's just part of you, brilliant, but this might be a bit unusual for some people. This might be a bit of an uncomfortable thing to do, you know, to, to write creatively or to write at all. Um, so I'm going to ask you to please have a go today and see what, how you get on. I'm going to introduce Europeana's seven digital storytelling tips for the cultural heritage sector to you. And then we're going to get writing. We're going to use the tips and we're going to use some great images from Europeana as prompts to trigger our imaginations. And I'd like you all to decide right now that you're going to have a go in this session, um, however sort of scared you might feel about it or, you know, however excited you might be, have a go. I'm sure you'll be surprised by what you'll do. And uh, I really love this kind of workshop because I'm going to give you some prompts. You don't know what they are. We don't know what's going to come out. And that's always really quite exciting. Uh, so when it comes to the writing, you write in whatever language is comfortable for you, whatever style. Um, after each exercise, they're only short exercises, I'd like to ask you to share your thoughts in the chat if you're comfortable to do so. You know, whether it was hard, whether it was easy, how you felt about it, did you get stuck, that kind of thing. There's no obligation to, to do that, of course, and I won't be asking you all to share what you've written, that's for you. Um, so you don't need to let that kind of um, fear get in the way of having a go. Although, of course, if you want to copy something into the chat and share it with everyone, fantastic. So this session is really for you to have a go. It's about trying something new. It's about how to get some ideas going and um, how to get you started or how to help yourself if you get a bit blocked when you're writing. And of course, I hope that it will help you in your writing if you choose to enter the Digital Storytelling Festival. And don't forget, there is a creative editorial category, uh, which can be completely um, creative writing, can be fiction if you want it to be, it can be all sorts of things. So my role over the next hour is to facilitate those exercises, try to keep us to time, absolutely not to judge your writing. OK, this is just about fun. It's about having a go out of the corner of my eye. I can see loads of words popping into the chat. So that's cool. OK. But before we go any further, I want to say something that some of you will find quite obvious and some of you might not. Storytelling to me isn't just a nice thing. It's not just a fluffy thing that we do for fun, although I do think it's a lot of fun. You know, it's a real skill and it's a valid way to spend our professional time. Um, it has a specific purpose. And I think that is to engage people with information that we want to share with them. So I think there's a difference between simply sharing some information with someone and getting them to care about that information and potentially to then take an action that you want them to take. So that might be simply to keep reading 
It might be to share a social media post. It might even be to buy something or to sign up to something. Um, so to me, the difference between sharing information and storytelling is that storytelling is about connecting on an emotional level. <sighs> Emotion, gosh, if you've come through um, an academic system, like many of us, like I have, that values things like testing, evidence, uh, quantitative ways of measuring things, then being told that you need to consider emotion can be a bit of an alien thing, I think, especially in a professional context. It can be a bit scary. Um, but when we write, whether it's a piece of creative writing or a professional editorial or a business report, social media post, the thing I think it's really important to remember is that however serious your piece of writing is, however important the person who's reading is, they are a human being, okay? And human beings have emotions. And by connecting with them, we can help that other human being to have a deeper understanding of our topic. So I think it's really important to use those emotions and the concept of storytelling, whatever writing we're creating, whether it's fiction or professional editorial or business communication. And I think, as I said earlier, that experimenting with creative writing, with style, with approaches, with thinking in different ways, it opens up more strategies for you if you come to write a factual piece or a kind of professional editorial. Um, so I think having a go at creative writing is a really useful thing for, for many um, applications. Okay, so I'd like to introduce you to our seven tips for digital storytelling for the cultural heritage sector. Now we created these last year as part of a task force, a piece of work looking at great storytelling examples from around the web and around the world. Uh, and we looked at them to see what made them engaging, why were we drawn to them, why did we like them? Now, you might have encountered these tips last year in the Storytelling Festival. Uh, you can find them on the Storytelling Festival Medium. And you can find them on Europeana Pro website. Uh, we made a little video, which I'm going to play to you, uh, in which some of the people who were involved in our task force introduced the tips. It's a really lovely little video. So then uh, later in the workshop, we'll do some exercises to explore these tips a bit further. So hopefully the video will now play. Digital cultural heritage collections are amazing. There's so much to explore. So, how do you make sure that the stories you tell through your blogs, exhibitions, events, social media and apps really capture the imaginations of your audience? Here are seven tips to help. Histórias pessoais trazem o passado para a vida. Pensa como podes apresentar experiências pessoais e mergulhar no significado humano de um evento ou de um objeto. E lembra-te, deves ser sensível aos contextos sociais e culturais das diferentes audiências. Porta alla luce il patrimonio nascosto. Riesci a trovare storie che non sono state raccontate altrove? Considera chi manca nella foto. Cerca gemme nascoste. Le collezioni digitali ne hanno molte. Il tuo pubblico può essere una fonte di idee? E anche i tuoi collaboratori? Digitale culturele collecties zijn een geweldige bron voor beeld. Onderbreek lange teksten of verhalen met afbeeldingen, video's of audiofragmenten. Gebruik hoge kwaliteit afbeeldingen en nodig mensen uit om erop in te zoomen en nieuwe dingen te ontdekken. Experimenteer en speel. Na brusca lezen de tussen beschept de saas, ze een programmatisme no taxid. Epices, diploïgesisas. Πρέπει να είναι απλή, όμως έτσι ώστε να ξέρουν οι ίδιοι που βρίσκονται. Και δώστε τους τις οδηγίες όταν μπορείτε. Ενώ βοηθήστε τους, εάν δεν είναι δυνατόν ε, να τους δώσετε συγκεκριμένες οδηγίες. Jede Geschichte braucht eine Handlung. Gibt es ein besonderes Bild, Zeichen, oder ein Ereignis, das den Kern deiner Erzählung gut beschreibt, verbinde die Details deines Themas miteinander zu einem großen Ganzen. 
Es ist wirklich so, persönliche Geschichten und gut ausgebildete Bilder sind sehr hilfreich. Le storie relative al patrimonio culturale devono essere basate sui fatti, ma non temere di utilizzare parole, immaginari o approcci descrittivi ed evocativi. Invita lo spettatore ad utilizzare la sua immaginazione. Prendi in considerazione tutti i sensi. Audio e video possono essere un mezzo di supporto. E divertiti. Want to find out more? Go to bit.ly, that's bit.ly, forward slash Europeana Storytelling. get it to move to the next slide. Okay. Oh. No, don't want to play it again. Okay, I'm just going to um, relinquish control, ask Tamara to get it to the next slide for me, and then I'll take it on again. Digital Cultural Heritage Collection. Thank you. Let me take control again then. So that's the seven tips. I hope that you um, you liked that little video. Um, I know it's a lot to uh, sort of take in, but we are going to explore uh, most of those tips a little bit more um, very shortly. Um, so I think it's time. Uh, request remote control. Here we go. Time to get writing. So grab a pen and paper or uh, open up a doc on your computer if um, that's how you want to, to do it. Okay, so we're going to get warmed up first. And uh, this is where those words that you have put into the chat come into play. I was just having a look through and there's some really lovely ones. I just wanted to point out one which was fantastic. Uh, let me scroll back up again. Uh, Putuwa. Um, I don't know if I've said that correctly. This is Rita. Um, he says it's a Sydney language word that means holding someone's hand while you warm the other by the fire. How lovely. Um, there's lots of very evocative words in here. Flabbergasted, um, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Lovely. Uh, what else have we got? Whimsical. The culture and book have come into there. And there's also a couple of um, uh, ones I quite like. Cake and chocolate, always a winner. Um, but I've picked a couple of these out of the list uh, for this exercise. Oh, excellent. Perfect pronunciation. Brilliant. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick uh, one of these words from your from uh, your favorite words and I'm going to ask you to write non-stop for three minutes and that's it okay that's all you have to do so you can write in any language you like you can write in any style it doesn't matter whether you write notes whether you write full sentences whether you write a perfectly crafted little short story whether it's a stream of consciousness if you want to start doodling or drawing you know it's entirely up to you the important thing is that you start and you don't stop so you keep going for three minutes try not to kind of have a minute of sitting there daydreaming and wondering no just keep writing and it doesn't matter what it is that you write okay so it can take any direction you don't have to stay with the word that I give you to start with. That's just your starting point, okay? Um, but if you find that you've got stuck and you, you are sitting there not doing anything, think back to that word again and start again in a different direction, okay? So I don't want you to worry about the quality of your writing or the quality of your ideas. This is simply about getting over the blank page and allowing yourself to write and having a go. And now... I can't uh, see any of you, obviously, so I can't see what you're doing, but I would like you to um, promise me that you are not going to cross anything out and you're not going to use your delete key, okay? The idea is that you don't censor yourself, you just write, write, write for three minutes, that's all. I'm going to set a timer for three minutes and then stop you. After that, I'll give you another word and we'll do the same thing again. So you start afresh with a new word for three minutes, and then again, you start afresh with another word for three minutes. So that's three times, three minutes with three words, okay? And I'll guide you through it again as we go. So if there are any questions, quickly pop them in now whilst I set the timer. Otherwise, I will give you your first word, okay? And of course, you want to translate this into the language that you're that you're writing absolutely fine. The first word I've picked out of that list was 
Melody. I'll type that in the chat. Melody. You can interpret that however you like. And I'm going to start a timer on my phone right now. So I will see you in three minutes. Go. Okay, and stop there on that one. Well done, everybody. I hope that you've written something that you managed to keep going for three minutes. Maybe give your arms a shake, maybe stand up, turn around, sit down, you know, reset your head a little bit. And I'll give you your next word, which is uh, home, H O M E, home. So, same thing again. I'll give you three minutes. Um, just keep going for that entire three minutes on the word home okay after the final word we'll have chance to kind of discuss a bit about how you've got on but for now we're just going to keep writing three minutes home
Okay, and stop there with that one. I hope everyone's getting on all right. That's two out of three we've done now. Again, give your arms a shake, have a quick look out the window, reset, slurp of water, whatever you need to do. Uh, turn the page, get a new blank page. Uh, we're going to go with our final word, which is a really nice specific one, tree. Okay, T-R-E-E, -E, tree. So again, if you've just joined us, we're doing three minutes non-stop writing just to get going, um, get over the blank page, just get our, get our imaginations going and our, our writing started for today. So you have three minutes. This is your last warm up uh, starting now, tree. Okay, well done everybody, thank you. Now usually when, the, when I'm in a room with people doing this exercise, when we come to the end, they all go, oh, and I can just imagine people in their little um, offices or bedrooms or kitchens or everywhere around the world now sitting back going, oh, well done, you've done your warm up. you've got writing, you've uh, written on three different words and I'm pretty sure um, that you will have written things that you didn't expect to write 10 minutes ago. So well done. So I'd like to know um, how you got on and we only have the chat to um, communicate, communicate with each other just now. So maybe think, is there um, uh, a word that describes how you feel about that exercise? Was it easy? Was it hard? Pop it in the chat. Uh, maybe you could tell us enriching. Oh, lovely. Um, maybe you could tell us which word you found the hardest or the easiest. What was the uh, what, what was the, the one that was most evocative to you? I feel like I was meditating, energizing, easy and funny, refreshing. Loved the homey home. Oh yeah, I'm really keen to know what you, home was my favorite. 
So it's 160 of you around the world right now um, doing this, which is great. Emotional. Okay. Ah, uh, that's really interesting. Somebody wrote the melody and tree text in English, but home in German. That's really interesting. It's fun. Makes us, these are going too fast. I can't read them all. Uh, keep getting in my own way. Now that's a really interesting point because that's what this um, exercise is all about. Really, it's about getting out of your own way. So it's about not censoring yourself. It's about not judging your writing or your ideas and just getting something down. And I think it's a really useful exercise to do at the beginning of a writing session. Um, or particularly if you don't know how to get started or you're having a bit of a block, just take some time out, pick a word from the dictionary or something that you see around you. Just give yourself that little deadline and that little discipline um, to do a little bit of writing and, and try and get out of your own way because you really do notice, don't you, like what's stopping you and maybe, oh, well, that wasn't the best word. That wasn't quite how I wanted to express myself. Just try and move past that for now and get something on the page because all that can come later when you've got your ideas down. Uh, when you've kind of got over that blank page thing, you go, then you can start crafting it and editing it and shaping it. But you do need that time, I think, at the beginning of a writing process to just get stuff out. Um, so I'm wondering how much fun and exercise it will be to do with children. I'm sure it'll be, yeah, really good. Uh, I found each word to have a different creative way of expressing. Melody was the most fun, home the most personal, and the tree to be the least, least satisfactory, is that? Um, surprised that both melody and tree were about a forest. Oh, so you've got a kind of theme going on there. Uh, words that took you back to your home, childhood, a life trip, great exercise. Yeah, especially when you've got lots of things to do during the daytime. That's the thing, isn't it? It's a really quick exercise. You know, you can do it in three minutes with just one word. I'm sure we can all find three minutes out of our day to just give ourselves that little sort of nugget of creativity. Um, I wonder, is there anybody who would want to copy um, a little bit of what they wrote into the chat? That would be really interesting. Um, three minutes is a nice time span, good. It was strange, everything I wrote was random thoughts. Yeah, you can kind of, because you're the words you're picking are quite random and yeah, you don't know what's gonna come up. Um, so I think that's quite, quite nice actually sometimes we want to get like I say get out of a get out of ourselves get away from you know censoring ourselves and thinking the way we might normally think so this exercise gives you um a sort of a framework for doing that and being a little bit um uh, exploratory and uh, you know experimenting childhood memories oh let's have a look Nino Melody, what's that? I have no clue. Is it a name of a person or what is it exactly? I wonder if people have made it up themselves and called something a melody. Yeah, yeah, don't get me wrong. I also know what a word melody means, but I don't want to think about the music. Mm, that's intriguing. Um, melody was the predecessor of my first proper boyfriend. I'm not sure what that means, but I'm intrigued. Um, Oh, this is something, Gaia. Melody is a space between love and fear. It's a time machine. Wow. Without the machine and the magic without a magician, the orchestra feels it, the audience consume it. Oh, you've put them all in. Brilliant. Home is a place where you feel good and safe. It can be full or empty. There can be chaos or quiet, silence and voices. A house is a space of freedom and maybe it can be a cage. Uh, this is also a good exercise for handwriting, which I did. That's another really interesting point. I don't know if you feel that writing is different, whether you do it with a pen and a piece of paper or whether you do it on a screen and typing. I certainly feel that some kinds of writing, particularly short things, I do much better by hand with a, with a pen. Whereas if I want to do something a bit longer than tapping it out on a computer, it is much, suits me much better. But yes, yeah, so I think there are different processes. I don't know the science behind it, I have to say you've got any links on that that'd be really interesting to know like what happens in your brain when you're writing by hand versus what happens when you're typing let's have a look at this other one. Oh, there's so many messages on here this is wonderful we will i think be able to share the chat um later on um 
the tree, the tree, it stands since forever. It was small once a long, long time ago. I sit under it and I wonder who sat here a thousand years ago or more. A thousand years ago, that was in 1022, middle ages. The tree was small back then, so nothing significant. Part of a forest maybe in which children played while they helped their parents collect wood and berries. I feel the oak, the bark, it's hard and wrinkled like an old woman's skin, though that is soft. But this tree has seen so much more than my grandmother, what a lovely link grew into a tall tree later, its brothers fell to lightning, to wood stoves, to fires of glee, to houses, to ships, but it grew. People started to take notice of it because it was so impressive and tall and also sacred. Wow. I've just finished reading a book actually, this reminds me of, uh, it's called The Island of Missing Trees by Elif Shafak. And uh, part of the book or a lot of the book is narrated by a fig tree which is a bit odd, but if you can get over that, it's a really lovely book and has all, lots of stuff in it about how trees and plants communicate and the ecology, but it's also a love story. It's a really nice book. Okay, so I think we should probably move on to the next one because otherwise I'm gonna to get too drawn into all these things and we won't have a chance to move on. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. It's just wonderful. Um, so our next uh, exercise, uh, is going to look at two of the tips uh, from the seven tips that I told you about that go really well together. Uh, so be personal and be evocative. Um, so personal stories can bring everything to life and help people relate on an emotional level. And um, being evocative is about you know, we can tell stories about cultural heritage, cultural history, and they can be based in fact, uh, that's brilliant, but we don't need to mean, that doesn't need to mean that it's dry, it doesn't need to be overly academic or technical. Um, if you've got um, a nice story, you've got good facts there, then you can be free to be a bit more evocative, to be descriptive, to invite a viewer, a reader, to place themselves in that scene. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, show you a picture that I found on Europeana. Um, and I'd like you to, I'm going to give you five minutes this time, so a little bit longer, to sort of look at the image um, and think about it. Um, I think that it might be easier if I just show you it straight away. So here it is. So we've got uh, a person in a bed, the blanket. Um, who are they? What's their story? Um, are they awake? Are they asleep? What are they feeling right now? There's some suitcases under the bed and a, a box and a suitcase. What's that doing there? Are they full? Are they empty? Has someone just arrived? Are they waiting to go somewhere? Um, what does that blanket feel like? Is it scratchy? Is it lovely and soft and comforting? I wonder what it smells like. I wonder where it's been. Uh, so what I'd like you to do is um, write for five minutes um, using this as a, a trigger, as a prompt. Um, so I want you to think about the personal elements to this story. How can you draw us in? And uh, this is a creative writing workshop, so we don't need to think, worry about you know, what the facts are or you know, who the, the artist was here or who sort of it really was um, depicted in this picture. This is your imagination that we want to open up today. So what's their story? How does it make you feel? How do you think they feel? Use your senses, what are the sounds, what are the smells? Um, what's going on here? So be personal and be evocative and descriptive. Okay, so again, you can use, you can write in any language, uh, the style doesn't matter. Um, you don't have to share your writing, so you don't need to worry about that. Again, at the end, I'd like to share how you got on and kind of what you felt about it. And um, if you're happy to in the chat, like we just did. Um, so I think without further ado, I'll give you five minutes on that time, unless if there's any questions, pop them in the chat and I'll respond on there. Um, and let's go for it. Five minutes, personal and evocative.
Okay, if you find a, an end to your sentence or find a place to stop, I'll leave that one there. Okay. Well done. So, what did you write about? Did you find that exercise difficult? Uh, easy? Did you get into it quite quickly? What can you tell us um, using the chat? Um, did you give the person in the bed a name? Can you write that in the chat for us? That'd be really interesting. Were they awake or asleep? Uh, maybe you could give us a word or two about the kind of the emotion that was in your piece or the emotions that the character was experiencing. What, what kind of things did you come up with? It was emotional, grief. I called the person a traveler. Mm -hmm. Easier than the other. <laughs> I love this. I loved it. I'm on the other side of the world in Australia and it's time to cook dinner. I love that like you can join in these events from anywhere in the world whilst you're doing other things as well. That's just fantastic. I hope that the, the kids appreciate the dinner, Rita. Um, a suitcase of memories. Oh, deep dream. A little more difficult than the other. It's a bit more specific, isn't it? So, yeah. Oh, a horror story. Poor Carlo. Oh, Carlo. What's happened to Carlo? I'm intrigued. Um, I thought he was anxious. The whole story revolved around him being anxious about a set of pictures. Okay. Mine was a she. And she just died. Uh, I find this one a bit more difficult, too. Reminded you of war. Yep. Um, a bit dystopian. At first I didn't like it, then I started to write, made a poem. I called the man Alexi Jürgen. Secret in a suitcase underneath the bed. Oh, I wonder what these secrets are. I imagined a woman stuck in limbo, the investigation office at an airport after 48 hours of interviews. Oh, that sounds, yeah, tiring. Susanna, a teenage Jewish girl. Oh, that's, these are going so fast, I can't see them on. What's this one? Let's have a look at Diana's. A passerby through the city asked for an overnight stay. It was a cloudy and somewhat gloomy day. I was unwilling to open the door to another lost soul. Still, I didn't even want to help the passerby. Who knows what brought him to town? I opened the door and saw a small, tiny creature, barely an adult and a little malnourished. I wanted to give him a meal as soon as I saw him, but I waited for him to ask. He passed the dating time quickly, and according to everything he said, he just wanted to sleep. I let it stay that way. A warm blanket and a soft bed were enough for him for now. He put the suitcase under the bed. This is how it is prepared by people who do not stay long. I call them passengers. Where they travel and what they look for always remains an enigma to me. I try not to get into an emotional relationship with them, but still give them enough warmth to feel good. Oh, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued here, not just by the person who's um, come for some help, but the, the person they've come to who seems to have done all this before, who's looked after passerbys, who knows a lot about people. Oh, excellent. Zachariah, nice name. I got to be the person in the bed. Ah, excellent idea, be personal. Uh, new room, new adventure, very tired, just arrived. Tomorrow I will discover the rest of the room and that box told me it was only for me. Tomorrow will be opened. Healing. It was on the run for many days, crouched in rural bushes, partly to hide, partly out of exhaustion, collapses on finally reaching the safe house. Wow. Excellent. Thank you very much for sharing. Oh, a musician. And the violin is in one of those suitcases. The shape reminded me of it. Ah, okay. Excellent. Well, well done, everybody. This is just lovely to have you um, sharing in the chat how you're getting on here. Um, thank you for that. Uh, let's move then to the next exercise, um, which is about telling hidden stories, which is tip number three. Um, so, as it says there, so much of cultural history, cultural heritage remains untold. Um, and by bringing hidden heritage, hidden stories to light, we can engage audiences, we can create a sense of community, of identity, of shared history. So the crucial thing is to think about who's missing from the picture when you're writing um, the piece. 
and can you give them a voice? You know, we've heard so many, so much of history from particular perspectives and uh, we can now look for other perspectives and other stories that can be told. Um, and of course, using open source uh, heritage collections is really good for that because there's so much there that hasn't been you know, put in exhibitions, so much more than, than can be shown in, in museums and things. So you can find hidden gems and um, Madhavi and Doug will uh, give you a tour of their favorite um, open access collections. I think it's tomorrow. That's going to be great. So that will really help with this tip as well. Um, so what I'm going to do is show you another picture. Um, and very deliberately, when I said who's missing from the picture, everybody is missing from the picture here. OK. There are no people in this picture. Uh, that's deliberate so that you can use your imaginations. So we've got a windmill in two different states of repair here. And again, this is a creative writing workshop. So where this windmill is, um, who built it, why it was in disrepair, uh, why it was repaired, doesn't, you know, the, the, the facts, the truth of that story um, is not our concern today. We're gonna use our imaginations to, to imagine that. Um, so whose stories do you think might be involved um, in this windmill's history? What happened, why? Um, Perhaps it's useful to think about who the most obvious perspective is so that we can perhaps avoid that or to try and find another perspective on it. Maybe the mill owner might be the most obvious one, but whose stories might be more hidden? Uh, what about the workers? What about the builders? What about the, the, might be the manufacturer of a really special part that makes this um, windmill work? Uh, what about uh, the wives and children of all those people who are involved in it? What about uh, maybe there was a, a boy who carried messages from the windmill to the local village or town for the owner? Uh, maybe there are neighbours around. Uh, maybe when this windmill was in ruins, there were, you know, lovers who met in secret amongst the ruins. Uh, whose story do you want to tell? OK, from what point in the windmill's history? Uh, so you can make up a story that could be hidden here. Um, and just start writing. Again, I'll say it again in case there's anyone that's just joined us, you can write in any language. Uh, the style you write in is entirely up to you. Um, you're not obliged to share your writing with us, so you can do entirely uh, what you want without worrying about sort of criticism or judgment. We're not here for that today. Um, but again, afterwards, I'll ask you to share your sort of thoughts and feelings about the exercise in the chat. So this is another one where you'll have five minutes. Um, and yes, if there's any questions, put them in the chat. And I really look forward to hearing what you come up with um, for this one. So this is, remember, hidden stories. And we have five minutes starting now. And I'll see you in five minutes.
Okay, and stop there. Finish your sentence. Okay, well done. Really intrigued to know what you came up with this time. Maybe uh, you could tell me in the chat whose story you told. You could tell me whether this came easily or whether it was hard. Tell me what you were drawn to. Maybe you could tell me sort of the tone or the main emotion um, that came up in your writing. Let's see what you've done. It's been so wonderful to see everything that you've shared in the chat so far. Who's going to tell us about their windmill? Anybody? There we go. Social commentary. Okay. The point of the townspeople who did not care about the mill, then the city people came in with the bulldozers to create a heritage landmark. Okay. The mill told. Ah, that's an interesting idea. How did the mill telling its story? The first time today I wrote in English, the hidden story was about a child who used to play there, became a teen, and the first kiss, and we store it for her daughter. Oh, how lovely. Uh, a bit of satire on a Tuesday morning. Mm, interesting. All right, this we've got war, we've got secret agents hiding places. An orphan who's allowed to live inside the windmill until the owner changed. Oh, and I wonder what happened when the owner changed. Windmills originated in Egypt. I did not know that. Made out of gold or precious stones, but nothing lasts forever. The modern man misread history and used it as a mechanism for generating energy. Or so he thought. Oh, I love this. Even today, if you go just close enough to a windmill, you'll sense the presence of an ancient sphinx. How wonderful. A forest that once stood where the windmill was built. Ah. I wrote another horror story. Okay, let's have a look at this. Farmer lived here and he had a windmill. When he left for his town, a storm came and this windmill got damaged. When the farmer returned, he saw this completely dilapidated windmill and he was so upset he left that place to never return. Then came a lady a few years later and she loved the place and she decided to rebuild the windmill. Here we see the new beautiful windmill. It's amazing how much you can get into like just five minutes, isn't it, in a few words. So again, they're going too fast for me to see. There's lots of things about getting stuck, getting things back, isn't there? I think the restoration there has um, piqued people's interest quite a lot. The earth rotates like this windmill. Nice. Time me on. Okay. And maybe tell me um, whether you liked doing this exercise. Was this an enjoyable one? Yes, excellent. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, lots of yeses. Excellent. Oh, good. Um, absolutely. Good. So I hope that there's some things here as well that can... Um, that you can come back to, like I say, if you need to, when you're starting a writing session, or if particularly, I think if you get stuck, um, I think if you um, have started a piece of writing for some reason, it's not quite working, you're not quite comfortable with it, but maybe you can't articulate why, it happens to me quite a lot. If you go back to this list of seven tips, just have a look, see if there's something there that might be helpful. Have you not been quite personal enough? Is there some, are you telling a story that's been told before already, you know? Go back to the list of tips and that they can really help you, I think, get unblocked. A little bit surprising. So it was the hardest. This was the hardest so far. Okay. Sometimes hard's good. Yeah. When you push yourself sometimes to do something that you wouldn't normally do. I think it's quite, it's quite useful. Okay. Brilliant. Let's move on to our last uh, writing exercise. Uh, so we're going to do two... Um, Two tips in one again here. Um, we've got be informal but expert and be specific. And I think these go quite nicely together again. 
So I think these work hand in hand. So you want to share something specific with your audience and you probably want them to see you as the expert. But that doesn't mean, again, that you have to use an overly academic or technical language. We can find the right balance of detail and, and tone of voice. So uh, as I said earlier, as long as your content's well informed, then your story can be experimental and playful. Um, and what we found when we looked at um, the examples um, in our storytelling task force was that uh, the successful, the things that we really liked, they tended to start from a specific detail and move out to a bigger picture. Um, and that helps if you've got a personal story, you know, and well chosen images can help you keep your focus. Of course, this isn't a law, this is not a commandment. There will be examples where being broad um, is, or being formal um, is what you need to do. But these are just, uh, these are tips that I think are really useful. So if you can start from a particular detail, know what's at the heart of your story, then you can keep uh, coming back to that even if you move away to, to other angles. Um, so that can really help you keep your structure and help you keep the core of, of your story as you go through. Um, and we want to learn from experts, of course we do, but we don't want it to be a chore. You know, we don't want to um, put people off with, you know, overly formal language, but on the same, by the same token, we don't want to dumb down to people, you know, you've got to find the right balance. Um, so I would suggest try conversational language, um, how you would talk to a friend, for example, you can use, of course, you can use specialized terms, but you might want to consider how you, um, how you explain them the first time around. Um, and think about who your audience is for a particular piece of writing and, and what kind of language they use. Um, okay, so our very last um, exercise is a picture I really like, again, found in Europeana. Um, it's a very busy picture, isn't it? This is, to the best of my knowledge, fairly random collection of museum objects made into a still life, okay? So as far as I'm aware, there isn't uh, an overarching theme that brings these things together. Um, and what I'd like you to do is become an expert in one or two, um, however you like, of these objects. I want you to pick something, I want you to pick something specific, okay? Um, and of course, you're free to make up all the facts. Um, this is a creative writing workshop. Just use these as your starting point. Um, and I want you to write about it um, as though you're the expert and you're talking to um, a peer of yours, so family member, friend, colleague, something like that. Um, maybe you're going to uh, imagine that this is a really precious item to you and you want to tell us why. Maybe you want, you're trying to sell it to somebody. Maybe you're trying to persuade someone to give it to you. Uh, maybe you're trying to convince uh, your housemate, your partner, your parents from throwing it away. No, you can't throw it away because, okay. So I want you to be specific, choose um, an item and be expert on it, but not too formal, you know, keep the tone accessible. Okay. And again, we've got five minutes. And again, you choose your language, you write however you like. Um, Try and keep going for, for the five minutes. Try not to use your delete key or cross anything out too much. You know, just get, get something on the page. Be inspired by these rather wonderful objects that are in front of you. Okay, this is our last one. So last five minutes of really concentrating on this. Um, okay, and that starts now.
Okay, and stop there. Well done. Congratulations, we have uh, finished all our uh, writing exercises for this for this workshop. Well done. Um, so, which object did you pick? What were you drawn to? Did you find it easy or hard to make up the uh, the facts to go with this? What kind of scenario did you put yourself in? Oh, we've got loads of stuff coming through. Okay, the book. Where's the book? Little donkey. Oh, little donkey right at the front there. A plate. Oh, and someone's found some information out about the plate. Excellent work. Candlestick. The dancer. Yep. The photographs chose the red shoes and formatted it as an email correspondence between a mother and a daughter. Interesting. Shoes and marmalade. The milk can. The photo, the bow tie, the black and white photo. The blonde doll. It was fun. Okay, let's see this one. This nice. My child asked me what is art. It's difficult to explain art to a 12 year old child. I gave him a task. Tidy up your room so that you put all your things that are out of place in one composition. What a nice idea. When you agree with it, take care that you put three objects that have great importance to you in relations with the other objects and that I as an observer can see that from that. In doing so, pay attention to the relationships of objects, their shapes, the light shadow they have in the exhibition, important and less important details and make up the whole. When he did that, we both wrote down the items he chose and exchanged pieces of paper. We wrote the same, a bird, a family photo of a doll in green clothes, three items that look after everyone else. Oh, how nice. Red shoes, the teacup, the purple parrot who urged us all to save the planet. Excellent. How did it do that? I chose the coffee, which reminded me of German colonialism. Matchboxes and toilet paper. Getting really into the story of the apples and marmalade. <laughs> Hedick Faltermeyer was about to fall into a vat of it. End Findus Industries' global domination. Wow. Professional bird preparer who gifted this bird to his mother, but she's creeped out by his talent. In this text, it gives insights in the work, which is necessary to make a good stuffed bird. Excellent. Okay, so we're coming to the end of this session. Um, and I just want to say a huge thank you for participating and for sharing in the chat. It's so lovely to see all the different ideas that come through. As I said at the beginning, you didn't know what was coming up. You didn't know what these prompts were. None of us knew what would come out of your writing today, uh, but it looks like lots, lots has. Um, and I really hope that these, um, these techniques give you a way to get started, give you a way to help yourself if you get blocked, give you a way to just have fun with some writing and hopefully give you a way of uh, getting into your digital storytelling festival um, entries. Um, so I think all that remains uh, for me to say is um, good luck for your writing, for your digital storytelling festival entries. Um, and again, thank you so much for joining in. Um, I'm going to go back and read through this chat in a bit more detail um, now if I can. Um, I really hope you've enjoyed it. I really hope it was useful. And yeah, enjoy the rest of the day and the festival. And I will hand back over to Alex, I think. Thanks, Beth, for sharing your spark and guiding a very big group through all the exercises. Thanks to everyone for your attitude. It was brilliant to see everyone being open, enthusiastic and brave and just sharing everything. Keep it with you throughout the festival, but also every time you are stuck in your work, you have to write a text and your inner critic kicks in. Just go for it, because as you experience, you only need three minutes to change everything and just free yourself, get creative and go get on the right track. Tanka in Japanese means a little song and is the oldest form of poetry still being practiced today. In its classical form, stretching back over 1300 years, it consists of 31 syllables in a configuration of 57577 syllables. Ekphrastic tanka is tanka which responds to artwork and brightening of days 
The first trilingual book in Irish, English and Croatian consists of Tanka in response to artwork by acclaimed Croatian artist Alfred Freddy Krupa. My name is Gabriel Rosenstock, a bilingual poet writing in Irish and English, and Ekfrastic Tanka is one of my favourite literary pursuits, works of art triggering spontaneous utterances guided by syllabic rules that come naturally to tankists after daily practice. I hope this presentation will encourage others to explore the literary, emotional, cultural and spiritual richness of Tanka in itself and in its interpenetration with works of art through what is known as ekphrastic Tanka. Fech an korana e kurhar mwil shavor, taim shalesh a stor, e kurhar mwil onutze, o kudach tus le shadam. Look, the korana is overflowing with autumn, beloved, as I overflow in you gently since the beginning of time. Islo Malia and Circus and Art Shartov Neil Gogum Lo Bidi Shaglion is Tigger Kach Ferjreen Sonariad. I'll give them my songs. Let the circus have them now. I've no use for them. Feed them to lions and tigers, or let the clowns juggle them. I search for my roots, I search for them within you. I'm searching deeply, madly, wildly, here and there. I'm searching everywhere. Machit frevige, lorgi monotsiad, is kordig daun e, lorgi mhaur as a voskachot. Is my lamb yelt? A dull trehine, few as a fe nachter, stard intine e, neat for schlieve horster, rod elle, a shafuji. It seems to take fire, even when covered in snow. It's a state of mind. It's not a mountain at all. Fuji is not of our world. And down ye an awin, and down ye at machud bluhe, kathis dainach down, the aglerin rivar ma, gomoiter e dainimme. How deep the river, how deep are these songs for you? How deep can one go? We fear drowning, beloved. May I drown now in your name? Naroli treke, nanimish naroli shin, tangacha treke. Trevena trek and down, Michigas Tussa regit. Bare abandoned tracks, it is these we should follow, all abandoned tongues, the abandoned tribes of earth. It's we who've abandoned them. Near Higaniad, near a hand there on spas, Chachas Behene, the Higadarichele, Tanga Arsa, Revoena. Aliens arrived, but no one understood them. They spoke to birches, they shared a common language. 
before Homo sapiens. Hi, I'm Cristina. I'm an independent consultant based in Italy. I would like to share with you what I presented last year for Digital Storytelling Festival. I started to build my story based on the seven digital storytelling pillars that you find listed below. Celebrating women, art and machine learning is the story I presented in Digital Storytelling Festival. My goal was to mix heritage photography and new technologies like artificial intelligence. To tell my story, I started searching some women portraits. Then I used the machine learning models to color these black and white images. Here you can find a list of all the free resources I used to build my story. Welcome collection for the original photos and a free machine learning software together with adult software. And this is what I obtained after machine learning process. I was satisfied about the results, but what about accessibility? Here follow a study that shows no conflicts. You can find the full article in dedicated pages of medium.com. And of course, you can enjoy storytelling trying yourself. Thank you. So hello everyone and um, welcome back um, from what I hope was a um, very relaxing um, and enjoyable break from the opening gala. Um, so we're going to be starting again shortly. Um, I really hope that you, uh, yes, enjoyed the videos and were able to watch some of them. And if not, just took the time to kind of have a break um, and maybe a stretch and get ready. Um, so shortly we're going to be moving on to the next session. So I'll just wait for the next slide and just check that all the speakers are here with us, which they are. So that's great. Um, so yes, everyone, welcome back to uh, the opening gala of the Digital Storytelling Festival. I've enjoyed the morning so much so far. It was great to hear. Um, and I would like to welcome you back to our next session. So our next session will be on the seven digital storytelling tips in action um, from Carla Colino, Beth Daly and Caterina Ruscio. Um, and just as a reminder, this presentation is being recorded. Um, could we move to the next slide, please? Thank you so much. So um, today we're going to be uh, hearing from three speakers. Oh, so first of all, I should introduce myself. Um, I'm George Evans. I'm Editorial Officer at the Europeana Foundation, um, and I am the host for this session. Um, and today we're going to be hearing from three speakers. We're going to be hearing from the three speakers who were on the previous slide, and um, I will introduce them uh, individually shortly. And they are going to be looking at how Europeana's seven digital storytelling tips can be used in action. So if you were able to attend um, the previous session, you will by now hopefully be um, familiar with these tips. And if you weren't able to, um, that's not a problem. We'll give you a brief refresher shortly. Um, so in the last session, we kind of explored, um, well, Beth Daly excellently explored um, how we could use these tips um, in our creative writing. And in this session, we'll hear about how you, we can bring some of those skills um, into practice, how they can be used kind of um, in professional life. Um, for people working in cultural heritage um, and also for the Digital Storytelling Festival. And that's what our speakers will be talking through um, today. And um, we also hope that there'll be an opportunity um, for you to share examples of digital storytelling in action that have inspired you as well. Um, could we have the next slide, please? Thank you, yeah. Um, so this, uh, this session is brought to you by the Europeana Communicators Community which is a specialist community of um, the European Network Association. Um, it's a community of professionals who work in and around cultural heritage, um, but also um, professionals who are passionate about promoting and sharing digital cultural heritage in action. Um, the community produces resources, runs events, and has um, an excellent newsletter to keep you up to date with all things communications and dig digital cultural heritage. Um, and they have brought you this webinar today. And um, if you enjoy it, which I hope you will, um, I would encourage you to explore joining the community and I'll provide some more information later on about how you can do that. Um, but without further ado, um, I would like to introduce um, our first speaker for this session. So next slide, please. 
and that is Beth Daly. And um, Beth will again be very familiar to you if you just attended our previous session. Um, but just in case you weren't able to, I will just introduce Beth. Uh, so Beth is a colleague of mine. She's Edi Europeana's editorial advisor and she is a cultural and creative writer. She works on helping engage a broad range of audiences in Europeana's work and content. Um, she has a PhD in creative writing and has published a novel called Blood and Water. And she led the Digital Storytelling Task Force, um, which produced Europeana's seven digital storytelling tips. So she's in an excellent position uh, to tell you about some examples of how Europeana has actually used the seven digital storytelling tips in action. Um, so I'm very pleased to hand over to Beth to speak you th through this now. Thanks, Beth. Thank you, Georgia. Um, yes, so in the last session, like Georgia just said, we were we talking about- We can't you, Beth. Can you hear me now? I haven't changed anything. Oh, yeah, there you go. Can you hear me? Oh, good, excellent, thank you. So um, in the last session, we talked about using the seven digital storytelling tips for creative writing. Um, and I also told you that um, my job uh, with Europeana is about uh, ensuring um, consistent communication and tone of voice and messaging across all of Europeana's communications. So in this little section, I'm gonna tell you how we use the tips to do that. So how we practice what we preach with those tips, really. Um, I think they're a really good checklist for helping you to structure and plan out and deliver communications, whatever your topic or your purpose, and they can be applied in so many different ways to so many different types of communication. Um, so I won't go through the list of seven tips again. What I'll do is show you some examples and show how they're put into action. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Oh, I am going to show you the list. I forgot about that. There you go. There's the seven tips. OK, next slide, please. There we go. So uh, we recently launched an exhibition um, on Europeana.eu called Women Writing Birds, which profiles five uh, American ornithologists and talks about how their nature writing changed scientific inquiry. So at the time, women were banned from academic institutions, and so their observations took place in the open air necessarily. So this is an exhibition that's telling the story of these five pioneering women. And we did a simple thing to make sure that this wasn't just us telling their story, that they could tell it themselves. Um, next slide, please. We made sure that every chapter contained at least one quote in their own voice. So this relates to tip number one, be personal. OK, this helps the audience to imagine themselves in these scientists shoes. And it reinforces that idea that I mentioned in the workshop earlier about us all being human beings that connect with each other and uh, we connect with each other to get a deeper understanding of a subject. So here we have uh, someone talking to us in their own voice. We can see them as a human being. And that gives us an insight into them that we wouldn't have if we only used the third person narration. If we only said, Susan Fenimore Cooper did this, she thought that, she, she wrote this. No, we hear from Susan herself. And that really helps us to get into, um, into the personality, into the person that we're trying to find out more about. Next slide, please. Uh, so using personal quotes in this way also helps us with, with one of the other tips, number six, which is be specific. So it helps us to remember that our chapter is about that one single person, helps us to focus on them and to understand who they were and how they worked. OK, and it also helps with tip number four, which is illustrate your story. Now, you can remember that illustration doesn't always mean adding a picture. Um, you can use a quote um, or a picture or a video or a piece of audio or use the space on the on the page or the screen, use the design um, to break up text and to allow a space um, to get into the topic um, that you're trying to share. So that's a nice, simple example. Uh, next slide, please. We now move to an example from Europeana Pro, which is our website for cultural heritage professionals. Now, at Europeana, one of the things we want to tell the world is that people use digital cultural heritage for a wide range of projects, uh, personal and professional. That could be in a classroom, that could be to make a video game for commercial sale, it could be to create cards to send to their family and friends. So we wanted uh, last year to create a web page with that message. Um, and when we were thinking about how to do it, we went and looked at the seven tips. And here's how we applied them. So tip one was, again, be personal. And this was crucial. So we decided that to tell this story about people using digital cultural heritage, we needed to allow people to tell it themselves. OK, we wanted to hear their own story in their own words about what they'd created. 
so we went to try and find um, quotes that we already had or to solicit um, quotes from um, people we knew had done something exciting with the cultural heritage. And in this way, we also sort of hit on tip number two, which is be informal but expert. So who's the expert here? It's the creator. So we want to hear uh, what they have to say about what they've done. And we worked with them to make that quote use accessible language. So it was uh, informal. So it speaks to everybody whilst maintaining the perspective that they're the expert. Uh, we also use tip number three, which is tell hidden stories. So we wanted to find stories here that we hadn't already told elsewhere. So examples of people making things um, that were not a result of being a direct part of a, you know, a specific Europeana project. It was kind of organic use of Europeana free range in the wild, if you like. And they're harder to find um, precisely because you know, they're hidden. They're not part of a Europeana project. So well, if you've got any more examples, please share them with us and we'll feature them on the page. Um, and because we want to tell quite a few stories on a single web page, we have to remember tip number six, which is be specific. You can see from the screenshot there, the quote's fairly short. I think they're about 50 words each. So there's no room for waffle. We have to be to the point um, and make sure that we're, we're working for a really specific point there. Uh, tip four is illustrate your points illustrate your story. You can see from the screenshot that we've, we've got some really lovely images there. We asked our contributors to share images that illustrated their reuse story and they make the page much more vibrant, much more um, accessible, much more interesting um, to, to scroll through than if we just had the quote by itself. A little note about tip five, which is signpost your journey. So you can just about see at the top of the page there, we've got some um, anchor links. Um, above there, we've got an introduction that explains what the page is all about. Then we split our quotes into four categories with anchor links at the top to make it easy to jump to the section. So you, we've told you what it's about, we've told you our sections, you click on it, it takes you to that section. That's really easy, that's really simple signposting means that you can explore that page and find the information you're interested in. And by combining all those storytelling elements, we hope that we contribute to number seven, which is be evocative. So we want to inspire, we want to open people's eyes to what's possible with Europeana content and hopefully the combination of that, those storytelling techniques do that. Okay, next slide, please. And then to share these stories a bit further, we also transformed them into some nice graphics uh, with an even shorter version of the quote that we shared on social media, like this. Okay, and the next slide, please. Okay, the last example I want to share with you is a bit of an unusual one. This is a screenshot from the filters on Europeana.eu. So when you search for something, you get a range of filters at the side that you can use to narrow down your search. Things like language, institution, image size. And then there's this one that says, can I use this? Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is because I think it shows how you can use just a little bit of storytelling to engage with human beings anywhere, even in a list of otherwise fairly boring filter options, okay? So it's personal, isn't it? Tip one, can I use this? And I think it's even a little bit evocative. Tip seven, if you hadn't already thought about using something, you just come to Europeana to look at it. And then you see this option phrased in this way, it might give you a new perspective, new ideas. Oh, I could use it. What could I use it for? I think the signposting here is really good, which is tip five. We've got a question at the top then a clearly labeled instruction, select whether you can use this. Then we have some uh, nice options below, which are very specific. They've got stats next to them. And you might also say they're informal yet expert. We're giving you expert information there, um, but we're not using technical language to explain it to you. And believe me, we could. <laughs> so my point is that every bit of text everywhere has the potential to be used to good effect uh, that is to connect with human beings and I hope that the seven storytelling tips will help you to do just that whatever you're writing thank you back to Georgia thank you so much Beth um, I do think that those are just really great examples that show how this the tips can indeed come into all aspects and that even when it might not be kind of a piece of creative writing or writing actually even about cultural heritage content they can still be incredibly useful so thank you so much for sharing those with us um, could we move to the next slide please and I will introduce our next speaker fantastic thank you so much um, so I'm delighted to introduce Katrina Ruscio who um, I can see has got her camera on. I hope we will hear from her in a minute. Um, so Katerina is an archeologist and professor of early Christian art in the American University of Rome. 
Uh, she's a PhD candidate at the University of Malta and her research, research focus is on the management of tourism of religious sites. Um, Katerina was also a member of the Digital Storytelling Task Force, um, which brought you the seven digital storytelling tips. Um, so she's also very familiar with them. And um, today she will be talking us through using this digital storytelling tips in education and cultural heritage experience. Um, so without further ado, I'm very happy to hand over to Katerina. Um, and the floor is yours. Hi, Katerina. Hi, thank you very much, Georgia, for the introduction. And I wanna thank you. Uh, for inviting me today, and especially Carola Carlina, because she contacted me personally to share my personal experience after the Europeana task force from last year that was very useful. Um, I work as a museum educator and a lecturer in a course at the university. And in these two contexts where I work, I have a lot to do with it, of course, with education and cultural heritage, especially because I deal with the different audiences and considering that the, that the audience that reads the storytelling on the web is also large and varied. Uh, I realize, uh, I have to say, how important the digital storytelling tips were uh, when teaching online, when it became a norm. I had the chance so to reflect and giving uh, a different structure to the learning process, uh, uh, making the learning process itself more accessible to people. Um, so especially when I get back to the activities in presence, uh, I look to more carefully and observe the audience to create a more engaging uh, activities. Uh, in my job uh, activities, uh, the images are uh, relevant tools. And what I try to do, it's um, uh, looking at the pictures, making them sometimes like words, important symbols uh, that together become an effective language. The first thing that I try to keep in mind that it's to, that I have to try to organize the material when I'm explaining things from the beginning until the end, just to for the construction of a good narrative. Can I have the the first slide, please? Um, this is a an, uh, um, a fresco a painting um, that I picked as example from a class that they had. Um, I picked this example because they wanted basically the students uh, during one of the activities to understand before starting the fresco activity, the process of making a fresco by looking also at the picture. And with a fresco lab, I wanted them to make a fresco so they could see what is the process that made a result like this one. Um, see if I can have the next slide so I can uh, show one more picture. Um, I, I try to be uh, to develop a personal narrative uh, of the things that I explain either in class or in the museum. The personal stories can really bring the past to life and help people relate. So I try to be personal and empathic with the audience. Uh, I try to create, uh, what I try to do, creation of group activities and on-site visits are very significant to describe it and emphasize the minor details and put them also in a broader context. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the scripted terms are very helpful in both the context where I work. So there are key terms, key words that become very evocative for describing the things I'm talking about. Uh, I, what I do, I just give a few words uh, that will be significant and will create a sort of a storyline uh, from the beginning to the end of what I'm explaining. If I can have the next slide, please. Uh, this is a picture uh, of one of the sites that I visit, along with some visitors, but also with the students. I try to be specific, uh, to, to try to, to, to look at the details, because looking at the details sometimes can be very important for giving a bigger picture and to personalize my stories. So uh, images, as I said at the beginning, are very important. They need to be evocative. They need to be engaging with people. And I like showing details um, in that sense uh, to, uh, continue, to continue with my story. Last uh, picture, please, last slide. Um, these are um, 
uh, quite important, making a comparison, because making comparison is something very helpful to tell uh, hidden stories. I got the picture on the left, uh, which is basically from a mosaic uh, in an archaeological site uh, in Pompeii. Well, I have the other picture on the right, uh, which is a painting from 16th century. Uh, Obviously, if you just look at the picture on the right, it might be difficult uh, to uh, understand uh, and uh, what, uh, what is the story behind. So making the comparison, uh, comparison helps uh, in using a different narrative and a different perspective. In conclusion to that, uh, I have to say that Digital Storytelling Task Force uh, became really valid support for me when I was working from remote at the first, then I realized how precious the tips could be also to improve the learning process in class and in the museum visits. Thank you for your attention. I'll get back to Georgia. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Katarina. That was so rich and I think kind of uh, really explored in particular the importance of looking at the details and encouraging your students to look at the details um, in the different sites that you're visiting and really think about what's behind them. Um, so thank you so much for sharing those with us. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Fantastic. Um, and I'm very pleased now to introduce um, our final and uh, next speaker um, for this session, who is Carla Carlino. Um, Carla is, doing, is a PhD candidate at the University of Naples L'Orientale, um, and her PhD is in Innovative Industrial Research but she's doing a specific project around digital storytelling. Um, she was a member of the Digital Storytelling Task Force um, and is also currently a member of the Europeana Communicators Community Steering Group. And um, I have to extend particular thanks to her um, as she really led to put this session together. Um, she will be talking through, um, as you can see here, the digital story of cats who became mummies. Show. So she will be thinking about using the digital storytelling tips and in particular how to use them for entries for the Digital Storytelling Festival of which she has some experience. Um, so I'm delighted to hand over to Carla um, and uh, for her to go through the slides. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Georgia, for your introduction and thank you for the work you carried out in organizing this event. And thank you also, Katerina, for accepting our invitation. Um, I'll try to ask for the remote control, if I can. Uh, so I am Carola Carlino and I'm PhD student at the University of Naples, L'Orientale. My research project focuses on uh, um, multimedia and narrative. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, a multimedia narratives of cultural heritage using digital storytelling um, as a method of analysis. I took part in the task force organized by Europeana on digital storytelling between 2020 and 2021. And with the precious support of Beth Daly, I coordinated the work of the first subtask that relating to definitions of recommendations. Therefore, participation in the task force organized by Europeana on how to achieve a good digital storytelling process was an opportunity for me to completely understand this approach and apply it to the current cultural context. Next slide. The phenomenon that we witness most today in museum context is that of an advertising of art, uh, of cultural contents which from simple objects on display become speaking objects. Next slide, please. Uh, capable of telling stories on their own in, a, in an interactive and engaging way. This evolution regarding the dissemination methods of cultural heritage will not have been possible without the aid of technology and these cultural institutions had not continued to focus on narration. Next slide. Furthermore, in recent years, more than ever, in the light of the pandemic events, um, it has been essential for glam institutions to be able to speak to public at distance, telling stories about their collections, their staff, and the restoration operations that have been carried out during the closing period. It was vital for museums to be able to maintain contact with the public at home and to ensure that emotional engagement did not dissipate. The COVID-19 pandemic has undoubtedly uh, provided an acceleration to the digitization process, especially as regards collections and communication methods. And by exploiting the accessibility criterion, it has been possible to develop um, audience engagement and audience development policies at a level that 
previously it was difficult to obtain. Next slide, please. Uh, in this plan for the implementation of communication tools, social networks widely used and immediate channels of diffusion and communication played an important role. This powerful communication tool characterized the so-called era of convergence and transformed people from simple users to content creators. Let's think of Instagrammers, bloggers, and cultural influencers who from the contents published on their social profiles have enlarged the field of application of the creation of cultural content according to the, to the logic of a spread of contagion. This is an event that we could define as epochal as it marks the clear transition from one way of communicating cultural heritage to another. So if the contents come from the public and are aimed to the public itself, then it means that the concept relating to the way of communicating cultural heritage has changed. So we no longer communicate from top to bottom for a slice of elite, but we do it horizontally, trying to satisfy the information needs of all the types of audience. The need to experiment new way um, with new expressive and communicative formulas have been felt by many museum institutions, starting with the museum directors themselves, who have often disseminated through software channels with this in which they work uh, in empty museums to show details of the collection and communicate them to the public in an equal relationship and using simple and clear language. Next slide, please. This, for example, is the screen of the campaign launched by the director of the Egyptian Museum in Turin, Christian Greco, entitled The Director's Works. In these videos, uh, published weekly on the museum's YouTube channel, the director walks through the room of the museum and from time to time, please go back. Sorry. And from time to time focuses on an ever-changing aspect of the Egyptian collection. Another form of promotion and dissemination of cultural heritage, especially in Italy, is that of comics. In 2020, the Italian Ministry for Cultural Heritage launched the Comics in Museums campaign. In collaboration with cartoonists and graphic novelists, comic book narratives were created to promote the cultural heritage of Italian galleries, museums, libraries, and archaeological parks, mostly addressed to an audience of young users. Finally, we cannot fail to refer to gamification practices and how the creative video game industry has earned an important and functional space in the context of the use of cultural heritage. Also in this case, in the Italian context of reference, there are several examples I could mention. For instance, Father and Son, the multi-downloaded video game from the Apple and Android online stores made for the Archaeological Museums of Naples, but also Pets for Future, the game set in London and Taranto, a city in southern Italy, whose narration is set against the backdrop of the Archaeological Museum of Taranto, for which the game was created. So, why did I tell you all about this experience? What does this have to do with digital storytelling, you might ask? Well, if we retrace them for a moment, we realize that all these sources, written, spoken, or animated, are based on an essential narrative fabric. This narrative fabric creates stories capable of capturing the emotional aspect of the audience, so we will remember one or the other example, this or that archaeological find. Without forgetting that um, stories can give life to new, uh, to new life to objects, put them back in circulation and trigger the mechanism of memory and sharing a reference to a common cultural heritage. On the occasion of the edition of the Digital Storytelling Festival, which took place last year, I chose to write a story to bring back to life and alight some archeological finds of particular historical importance. My story of cats who became mummies features five cats mummies from the first century before Christ and now preserved at the Umberto Cerato Oriental Museum in Naples. The choice to tell a story about the, uh, these mummies derives from the need to make known in an immediate and simple way the ancient and fascinating practice of animal mummification and the veneration that the ancient Egyptians reserved for cats considered sacred animals. So I will say that the genesis of uh, the story was dictated by the tips B specific, that is the sixth one. 
I concentrated on a single topic. I looked for images that would well represent the object of my story and highlighted the details. Another indication that I followed is that of tell hidden stories. Uh, from what I have seen, I have been able to see it. There are no stories related to animal mummification, so there are many scientific articles, papers, but not stories. Furthermore, my story is a valid support for seeing and investigating parts of these objects that are not closely and physically accessible. When I thought about the story, I imagined it uh, um, addressed to an audience of children, and then I extended the audience to a wider one, but not an expert one. It was therefore important to communicate with a simple and immediate language, which did not diminish the value of my story, as suggested by the tip being formal but expert. Finally, in this story, I also told the intrinsic meaning of the mummification process, of the sacred and religious value it had among the ancient Egyptian people. I tried to bring out personal elements so that the user could somehow identify with the atmosphere of the past, made of golden sand, and priests who were custodians of an ancient knowledge. So the last tip I was inspired by is be personal. So I think that the time at my disposal um, is over, so in making room for the next activity and hoping to see many of you to participate, I want to conclude with the words uh, by Rudyard Kipling. If history were told in the form of stories, it would never be forgotten. So I leave the word to Georgia Evans, and I thank you for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Carla. That was uh, brilliant. Some really um, in amazing examples of digital storytelling in action and how some different institutions have approached it. Um, and also, I really hope uh, some inspiration for everyone watching about how they could build the tips into uh, entries for the Digital Storytelling Festival as well. Um, so we're now going to move to an activity where we would like to hear from you. Uh, obviously, we're in a webinar, so we can't see you, but we hope that um, uh, the audience will be able to use the chat as you did with Beth. Uh, in the previous um, session. So first of all, I'm going to try and see if I can share my screen to share our activity with you. Um, so can you see, oops, sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties. Apologies, I was having a technical difficulty there. Let me try again to share my screen. Can you see a Padlet board? Yeah. Yes, excellent, right, apologies. So I hope that everyone can see a Padlet board then. Um, so this has been put together um, by Carolyn. And what we have here is um, we have um, the seven digital storytelling tips and we have some examples of them in action below. And um, we, uh, Carol is going to talk through this, so I'll hand back to her in a moment, but what we would love is if in the chat you can share your own examples of maybe a, an institution that you've seen that has done some really fantastic digital storytelling in action, your own idea of how you could use one of the tips, um, or an example of something you've been thinking about as a topic to tell for the festival that you'd like to inspire one of these in, and we will hopefully be able to add to the Padlet. Um, so I will hand to Carola to, um, to add some examples, to talk through some examples. Yeah, uh, maybe it would be appropriate to show the, explain the audience why we chose these examples. So, uh, we think that all these examples could uh, best represent the seven tips. For example, for the first um, tip, be personal, we chose your story, our story, because uh, it shares personal stories of US migration and immigration with a focus on cultural objects and identify, making the storytelling very personal. Or for another, the tip um, um, illustrate your points, um, argues that one of the strengths of cultural heritage is the wealth of visual images. But it's not only important to have a lot of images, it is also important uh, to make sure that they are seen uh, very well, especially if you can zoom in on the details on the image, enlarge it and so on. Uh, so that's why we chose Gods in Color, Golden Edition, um, as an example, because it is a source that it includes uh, large and high quality images um, on its scrolling page, 
and it is possible to zoom in on the details of the image. Then, instead of my favorite tip, that is tell hidden stories, uh, we selected the source Jones Lebanon because we think that it is the best example to show how hidden elements need to be made known. Uh, in this case, the hidden element is the um, Jewish, Jewish minority in Lebanon, and we believe that their story has been told in the best possible way. Furthermore, storytelling, it is important not to bore your audience. Uh, uh, this is why it is important to use simple language, even funny when possible, uh, so that even difficult or boring content can be understood. Let's talk about Mites, baby. Is the podcast you didn't know you needed to learn about ancient mites in a simple and light way, written by someone who uses simple but expert language. To this tip, I will add uh, the recommendation, the last one, be evocative. Uh, so it is fine to write stories based on real facts, but the language must, must not be dry. So go for poetic, descriptive, and evocative forms that can help the receiver of the story um, get into the atmosphere you want to reconstruct. In our view, 80s New York City is the best example of, a city, of how a city has been perfectly reconstructed from photographic archive images on an interactive map that accurately re reproduces the city. And finally, don't forget to send post your journey Otherwise, the user might not find his way out. And in, in these things, that talk is the classic example of how to keep text and images together in a compact way. And the, left, the very last one, don't forget to be specific. We enjoyed learning all about the true scans through the source shown here, that is Time Tales Yetruski. So now it's your turn. Please write all the, your examples, your third examples in the chat, and we will add that, them on the public. I can see that um that Beth has added an example for be evocative, which um I'm really uh, enjoying because it's so different to the 80s New York City, which we've got on there, which um is from the British Library and uses audio recordings of bird song. Um Beth, I don't know if you can say a bit more about why uh you like that one so much. Um sure, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um I haven't looked at it for a while, but um I do at the beginning of it, it tells you to slow down and enjoy and that invitation to slow down and enjoy and then to be immersed in it's kind of I can remember a black screen I can remember like little bits of light coming in and out and the sound of birdsong and being in a forest and yeah I just found it took me into a different world which was quite evocative because I have, haven't seen it looked at it for a while but I still have that feeling of it I can still remember how it made me feel so I think it's quite successful and it's always lovely to be in a, in a woodland surrounded by birds isn't it fantastic Thank you. Um, I can also see that someone has commented in the chat that um, Sandra, that you enjoy images that let you swipe from present to past, um, which I also think is a really great example. And I suppose maybe has some signposting of your journey in because it takes you through um, a story through the ages, but um, there might be other tips in it as well. And we also have another great New York Times story with Dart. Yeah, and I can see that takes you through some Dutch still life. Um, one of my own favourite examples from Things That Talk, actually, which is um, on signpost your journey, um, is kind of takes through the girl with the pearl earring and that zooms in on specific on specific kind of aspects of, um, of the story. And it also takes you from kind of creation in the workshop to how we see her in the present day, um, which again makes those connections really nicely. Yep, uh, I can see we've had a question about the video games that were mentioned. Um, can you think of any others that kind of might use uh, these storytelling tips or digital storytelling? So we've shared some examples um, with you here. Um, I think we could also share the slide to this Padlet so that uh, the link to this Padlet so that we can, um, so that people can add examples and explore the ones that we have um, have on here. Um, but I hope that's given you some ideas and inspiration. Um, and I think now, Carla, shall I stop sharing my screen and go back to the presentation?
great. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Um, could we go to the next slide tomorrow, please? Fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we really hope that you have enjoyed the session today. Um, so it's we've hopefully talked you through some examples of kind of uh, amazing digital storytelling from different cultural heritage institutions and projects. Um, hopefully given you some inspiration about how you could use these um, and also how you could um, you could bring these into your own work. Um, so how, what can you do now? How can you move forward? Um, so we would really encourage you to explore and use the seven digital storytelling tips. We've had two sessions of them, of them today. Um, obviously uh, the session first that talks you through using them in creative writing and now our session with examples of them in action. Um, of course, we would really encourage you to enter the festival's competition and to use the tips. Again, Carola gave some great examples of how she embedded them into her entry from last year. Um, I think telling untold stories is something that really struck me, that kind of noting that there'd not been much written about these mummified cats before and really uncovering that story um, was really fantastic. So maybe you can use these tips in your own entries. Um, and finally, um, you can join the Europeana Communicators community. So as I said at the beginning, this is a specialist community of the Europeana Network Association. Um, it's free to join and um, you get access to kind of uh, webinars, to resources and a really inspiring newsletter. Um, and it was also the community that um, kind of supported the task force investigating and, and which produced the seven digital storytelling tips. Um, and if you'd like to get involved with more things like that, we would really encourage you to join. And um, I can see Beth Bailey has just put um, the link into the chat. Um, so we are a little early, but I would just like to say a huge thank you um, to all of our um, all of our speakers and also to you as an audience. And please do keep sharing your examples of digital storytelling um, in action in the chat. Um, and I wish you an absolutely fantastic rest of the gala. So thank you so much for your time. Um, we will shortly be moving on to um, the next session, um, but we're running a couple of minutes early. So I just want to check with my fellow hosts that we're ready to go. Thank you so much. I'm looking in the chat. It's great to see um, that you're inspired to apply these tips. Thank you. Um, I'm just checking if we're ready to start. Could we move to the next slide, please, tomorrow? Great. Thank you so much and for bearing with us with that transition. So um, I'm really uh, excited to introduce um, the next session in our opening gala, um, which is about telling history stories with video and will be given to us by Sunuta Raghu. Um, so Sunuta is, has produced news and news products for platforms with six to 200 million users. Um, she built and leads the award-winning video newsroom of scroll.in, which is an independent news publisher and media organization in India. Um, her latest project is a limited historical series um, on India in the 1970s, and she also presents um, and executive produces um, a weekly show on the climate crisis and sustainable solutions, Eco India, in partnership with Jewish Well. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce her to give you the next session, and uh, Sanuta, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, and thank you, Georgia, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Europeana, and 
the Heritage Lab for organizing this. I've been listening into uh, the, the earlier sessions and it's, it's very, very interesting. And it has been sort of very educational for me as well. So uh, let's go. Right. So I will be talking about digital storytelling and uh, a video and the intersection of the two. Uh, so quick introduction about me. I work at scroll.in, which is a top independent news publisher in India. We have about 12 million users visiting us every month for news and analysis on uh, politics, culture and sports. And I head uh, the digital newsroom here uh, at scroll. Um, what we're essentially going to talk about today is how to tell effective stories using digital video, right? And I want to leave you with two takeaways by the end of this. One is what is the ecosystem that you're operating in uh, when it comes to digital video? And the second is what are some of the forms uh, of storytelling that work within this ecosystem? So I will, of course, add to the seven tips that uh, we've all just learned about, and I won't repeat those. Uh, and I hope uh, you know you find this useful. Feel free to screenshot uh, any of the slides uh, that you think are helpful, and we'll of course discuss anything you'd want to uh, later in the Q and A session. Uh, so this slide that you see here is what I call uh, the game of digital video, right? So every digital first video creator, be it Netflix or be it Tasty, which makes food videos on uh, Facebook, for example, uh, works around this model. So what is this model? If we were to break it down, uh, you have user needs right at the center, you know, which guides experimentation of what video you're going to make, what are the topics you're going to work with. And that experimentation leads to learnings. And that learning is again then applied to more experimentation. And you essentially have a loop uh, which leads to consistency. And at the end of the day, experimentation, learning, and consistency guided by user needs is what will get you success in the digital video, uh, in, in the digital video and the social video space is what we've learned. Uh, but does this mean that you run an infinite number of experiments aimlessly and just shoot uh, you know, in the dark and see what sticks? Of course not. So let's sort of figure out how do we streamline this process and how do we make sure that we know what we're doing, right? Uh, so two questions uh, that I name are your step zero. You know, before even starting the process of creating digital video, the two things that you need to know uh, are who is your user and what is your moat, right? Uh, so let's start with who is your user. And if you haven't started the process of uh, making digital videos yet, uh, I'm assuming you would have a sense of who your targeted or your intended audience is, who your intended user is. So this is applicable to either. So your typical user that you already know of, and of course your intended audience. So what is their age group? What is their gender? What is their uh, geographical location? Are they mobile first? What is their preferred platform? And what do they exactly need from you, right? So that's what, uh, I think that's, that's, that's a huge sort of uh, thing that you need to address right at the beginning. What does your user need from you? So once you've completed this exercise, uh, what you would essentially have uh, is a statement for yourself and for your team to, in, in a very clear manner, to understand who your user is, where do they live? What is their age gap? What is their age range rather? Uh, what do they watch uh, the videos on? And what do they need? Uh, you know, what, 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 what problem do they need uh, to solve? So I'll give you an example from, uh, from Scroll where I work, right? So my typical user, uh, so this sentence for me would translate like this. So my typical user who is male, female or other, uh, 25 to 34 years old, lives in an Indian city, speaks English and watches videos on their mobile phone, needs a way to contextualize the daily flood of news they are exposed to. So that's what that's what uh, sort of is 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 what my statement looks like. Now this of course could vary greatly depending on who your typical or intended user is, right? So once we know our user, we need to figure out where it is that we can add real value to. 
right? So that moves me to my next slide, which is what is your mode? So essentially what this is, is a resource versus intention audit, right? What are you good at and what do you intend to do, right? So what is your strength? Uh, who is your competition? Do you have something that the competition can't copy? And this is a huge, uh, because this is, this is so huge because the, the uh, video space right now is flooded with people, right? So do you have something that the competition can't copy is sort of, you know, a, a huge uh, thing that you need to address very early. And what can you add with what can you add value consistently? And consistently, especially I haven't highlighted or made anything else bold, but like consistently and doing this consistently is, is where you will actually begin to see uh, results. Right, so uh, again, like the last slide, you would have something like I have enough capacity with, and you would write down your strengths, especially uh, is you would write down your most, uh, you know, important uh, sort of what, what is your biggest strength. And I would, uh, this, is, this is also a term I learned very recently, which is sustainable competitive advantage, which is what a moat is, and what would uh, sort of bulletproof you uh, when it comes to other people copying what you're doing, right? And you can do this better than X, Y, and Z. So your three top competitors to execute your plan and consistently, right? So these two statements essentially give you uh, a very clear idea of what it is you're doing and whom uh, are you catering to and what are your strengths and what you're going to deliver over a long period of time with consistency, right? So I'll give you an example uh, of exactly this, of how we approached it when we were starting in 2016. Uh, so we figured out very early that we had a superb graphic design team. And this was our sustainable competitive advantage. And we had people who could comb through lots and lots of information and write up a 270 word script very quickly. Right. Uh, we didn't have someone who could provide analysis or tell narrative stories, so we avoided that in our early days. Uh, my team had too few people at the time and we wanted to build an inventory, uh, which is why we focused on evergreen content instead of only relying news. So we ensured that uh, creating evergreen content would allow us to be consistent as opposed to uh, giving uh, sort of relaying news on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Uh, so this is how it translated uh, for us. So essentially what this would tell you is, you know, it tells you your strength, it tells you your, uh, you know, what you're good at and what you're especially good at. It tells you who your top three competitors are and, uh, uh, you know, what is your, sort of plan based on these above parameters, right? Uh, now this again, some basics of storytelling is an addition to what uh, the earlier speakers have spoken about, which is why I've said some and not the only basics of storytelling. But I think these are most useful when it comes to video storytelling, especially in the current climate that we are, right? Uh, so the first one is to, to balance facts and emotions. Uh, so we know, of course, I mean, I don't need to tell you that facts are important, uh, but when it comes to emotions, digital video today is very, very high on uh, engagement metrics, right? So when, if, if you're able to sort of balance facts and, and emotions, what you get is credibility as well as um, engagement. And it's, it's, it's going to take a little bit of a trial and error for you to, uh, or, or it did take uh, some bit of trial and error for us to sort of figure this out. But uh, a good nonfiction video story uh, would have a good balance between facts and emotions, right? So that is, that is I think, one, uh, one basic that I want to leave you with. The second uh, basic is, I think this is a very, very beaten phrase, uh, but peel away one layer at a time, right? When you're telling a story, a lot of the time, the content that we work with or the information that we work with, especially for news, for example, can be very dry, right? Uh, so if you're able to sort of craft it as a story, for example, so I, I wanna give you an example of uh, a show I work on called Eco India, which we produce in partnership with uh, Deutsche Welle. And so our stories are essentially, uh, they're solutions to, 
very very large environmental problems that we face today right so how do you how do you peel away one layer at a time uh, for such a story so we've divided our stories into something called problem uh, context and solution so you establish the problem by uh, you know having a case study uh, you explain a macro problem and we'll get into the narrative storytelling a little later in this in the slides but i'm just giving you a very quick example here so you explain the problem uh, of a very macro uh, you explain the problem through a very micro case study then you move on to why it matters and contextualize this and then you come to the solution right so that is you're going layer by layer to the solution is is what i mean by uh, a peel away one layer at a time um let's move on sorry i'm zooming in and I'm, I'm hoping to have a lot more questions from you three yeah so the three types of storytelling that have worked for us uh are narrative-led storytelling information-led storytelling and interview-led storytelling so let's sort of sort of break each one down specifically right so narrative led storytelling is what i was just telling you about it is a uh, people or, or, or person first it is a micro story giving you macro context so you have one person sort of representing uh, a larger group of uh, people or a larger problem and what it creates is empathy and relatability so what we've also, uh, you know, what we've also learned as this type of storytelling is sort of equivalent to your long read, right, on print or text. Uh, so it's something that you would consume on a Saturday morning or a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday morning, right? So it's it's something that requires time and effort on the user's part, on the viewer's part. Uh, so which is why you can be indulgent with it and say, okay, let's make this about eight minutes or eight minutes and plus, uh, especially in, in, in the you know, domain of digital video. Eight minutes is a lot of time in the domain of digital video, which I'm sure many of you know, where you know, we're dealing with five seconds and 10 seconds sort of uh, you know, scroll videos. So narrative-led uh, storytelling is, is something you would, if, if, you, if you do want to create something like that, you would say, okay, I would, I would uh, you know, use this for my weekend audience or someone who doesn't, uh, sort of, you know, doesn't have, uh, you know, too much of cognitive load uh, on any sort of specific day when they come and watch this, right? Uh, the second one is information-led storytelling. Now, this is uh, essentially your, uh, so I have categorized it as 10 to 90 seconds, but again, it can be longer, but 10 to 90 seconds is what usually works for this particular format right uh, so snackable again is everything from your insta reels to your tiktok videos to your uh, shots on youtube uh, to facebook videos and everything that any story that you can tell within 10 and 90 seconds right what you do here is get straight to the point you have your sort of basics of journalism which is five w's and one h is uh, is is how you would tackle that story there isn't really any build up that you would add to this you would get straight to the point with a hook right at the top uh, and of course you would tell these with uh, text or graphics or a presenter uh, and the other thing that i have uh, sort of added here or mentioned here is uh, if if you are uh, you know looking at adding text to your videos for example uh, so a rule that a lot of us follow is three words equals one second, right? So uh, uh, if, if, a, if a viewer is, is watching your video, then every three words is one second. So, you know, a lot of us, I think, have made the mistake of taking away the text too quickly. And this works even for subtitles, but taking away the text too quickly or taking away, uh, you know, any other bit of, uh, uh, you know, sort of visual information too quickly. Uh, so three words per second is a good rule to follow if you are adding text to your uh, to your videos. And the third one, of course, is interview led uh, storytelling. 
where you can go up to sort of you know five minutes is a good is a good space though podcasts now have come and completely sort of uh, you know sort of kill this metric where you have you know people talking for three hours and four hours but on video I think a good uh, uh, you know I mean to start at five minutes and go on uh, for however long your user uh, you know requires uh, that that particular content from you is 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 uh, is, is a good place to start, right? Uh, what, what I've learned with uh, interviews essentially is uh, it's exploratory, right? You're learning about something along with the viewer and that's the feeling uh, you need to sort of give away if, if you are using, uh, if, if you do have an interviewer in the frame and a person is talking to you, you're learning, the viewer is learning something along with uh, uh, you know, the interviewer as well. So that is, I mean, it needs to be exploratory like that. And how can you make me look at a subject in different light? I think a lot of uh, interviews that we see these days are uh, sort of follow this, this pattern and it's no longer just, uh, you know, a, a, a set of questions just asked uh, out of nowhere, but it's 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 a set of it's a set of questions which actually get you to see something in a different light. And I'm talking about good interviews here. Uh, so these are the three uh, you know uh, styles of storytelling uh, that we follow at Scroll. Uh, I've left the fourth one blank because what we also usually do is uh, we mix all of them up. And it works, it works really, really well. And I hopefully at the end of the session, do you have, if we have uh, the time, I'd like to show you one video where we've used all three styles, uh, you know, together and, and, uh, and it works brilliantly. It's, it's, it's got us a lot of engagement and uh, quite a bit of views as well. Uh, so moving on from here. Yeah, so this I want to spend a little time on uh, to look at five uh, to look at the five best practices, right? So the first one is the critical five seconds, right? Now, uh, many of you may know that video, all, all platforms uh, that have online video these days uh, have the autoplay uh, function. And it's, it's presented to you in, uh, in a large feed. And if you, if you miss that, uh, you know, that scroll moment, if you miss that, if if you miss that moment to hook the audience, then they've essentially gone uh, to the next video or the next post or you know whichever platform you're consuming it on, whatever the next item is. Uh, so essentially, what you're seeing by adding a hook at the at the start is you're not you're not actually sort of making a case for a buy-in right at the start. What you're saying is, look you know, come in, take a look, come into our shop, take a look and see if you like it, see if you stay beyond the point. Of course, there are other other things that are the hooks that you could add throughout the video so that they watch your entire video. But right at the start, the first, uh, you know, the, the user nowadays, the modern user, today's digital user has been conditioned to make the decision in the first three seconds or the first five seconds if they want to watch the video or not. So it becomes absolutely crucial to make sure that the first five seconds are, uh, you know, you have a hook there of some sort to sort of bring in the user, right? Uh, so the second point is uh, unique and repeatable is sticky. So what I mean by that is, this is the formula that that someone like uh, you know that like TikTok or Instagram Reels would use, which is you know a hook, dance step, or uh, you know so even someone like uh, a Buzzfeed use, would use for uh, for their listicles. So what it is is it's unique to individual creators who are making these, but that hook, dance step is repeatable. Right or even for listicles, why these you know ten things you need to know about these particular uh, this particular item or whatever works is because the format is uh, is is repeatable, but you can apply that format to sort of multiple uh, mul multiple stories, and also it's you know it's hooky. Uh, the third the third thing, and I think this would be sort of 
uh, you know, the biggest takeaway or rather uh, the most important takeaway if we do want to create videos in the, uh, in, in this, in the social space is adapt to the platform, right? Uh, so, so once you've done the first bit of exercise where you know where your user is primarily consuming uh, the content that you make or uh, you know what you intend to make when you know that uh, then you know to adapt to that particular platform so for instance for instagram reels for example or for tiktok or for youtube shorts you would make vertical videos right uh, as opposed to horizontal videos they wouldn't take uh, you know, there'd be two black bands on top if you put a horizontal video. Uh, if you want to do a, a, a narrative-led story, which is eight minutes long, you know, you would do uh, a horizontal video, a 16 is to nine uh, horizontal video. Uh, also, if uh, the other thing is so, uh, for for Facebook, for example, 90 seconds to three minutes is, is sort of the sweet spot in terms of the duration of the video, right? Uh, for YouTube shots, of course, it's 10 seconds, Instagram reels 10 seconds. But for YouTube, the longer videos, eight minutes is, is uh, the sweet spot. Anything below uh, does, does get uh, engagement, but eight minutes is, is a, a, good, a good spot to sort of uh, aim for. So things like that, if, if you know uh, these, these uh, you know, these, these things that you need to look out for in, in, in terms of specific platforms, uh, then it becomes easier to adapt your content to, uh, to them. And uh, just, just as an aside, hootsuite.com is a good space to sort of uh, look this up. They have very, very uh, sort of elaborate toolkits on uh, you know which platform has what aspect ratio and what works, and it's it's uh, it's it's a good starter kit uh, that they've created uh, for all platforms, uh, all social platforms today. Uh, the fourth point is, I think, uh, also very important, which is make your video mute friendly. Uh, now, this is this was uh, you know uh, this was huge in uh, 2016, 2017, where about 85% of all video was watched on mute, which is why we used to painstakingly put subtitles on every video uh, earlier. Luckily, now what they've done is they have um, auto subtitling uh, on almost all platforms, uh, but it does it does really really help if you have uh, you know good text. Uh, ex explanatory text right at the beginning uh, to to establish uh, you know a mute friendly sort of viewing uh, it what what it essentially uh, does is you know it's, if someone doesn't have uh, their earphones or if they're watching at office for example then mute is uh, still largely watched it used to be about 85 percent uh, a few years back, but it's come down a little bit, but not not that we could we can completely ignore it. Uh, and the last one is, of course, map your users interaction journey. And this has sort of changed the game for us. And I can't tell you how uh, important this is. So what I mean by this is um, if we could take the example of YouTube, right? Uh, so we upload uh, Eco India to YouTube, for example. Uh, so start with where we uh, where the user discovers you right so it's either on the side panel of a, of a video that you're already watching or it's uh, through a search query right so these are the two aspects or from a google search query or a bing search query that that brings you to to youtube right so the first thing you would see is how optimized is your headline because if so for example if if on YouTube, if if the headline goes above seventy characters, you know it goes into ellipsis mode, uh, where a lot of it uh, that you've said after seventy characters uh, could be lost in translation, right? Or the person doesn't get to the viewer doesn't get to uh, see it at the point of uh, at the first point of interaction, right? So that is that is sort of a good uh, number to keep uh, handy. How optimized is your thumbnail? I think everybody. Uh, who's worked in digital video or digital sort of content creation overall sort of talks about how important the thumbnail is and how it needs to act as again a hook and also act as uh, something that people want to click on so uh, 
uh, under 30% of text and a very, very interesting uh, visual that would make people want to click on is, is something that the user interacts with next. So that is something that you need to keep in mind. So what tags are you using? Uh, tags are also important when it comes to uh, YouTube because, I mean, you're able to sort of also uh, look at your competitors that way and if that tagging leads back to your video. Uh, is your video bringing in referrals? Are people interacting with your calls to action? Which are the which are the cards right at the end? Who is commenting? And uh, what kind of videos are getting liked? So mapping your uh, users' interaction journey will, will essentially give you more notes on uh, what kind of videos you can make, or rather, uh, what is the sweet spot between what you want to make and what the user is watching. Right, and that is, I think, a lot of us uh, sort of want to find the answer to that because you know we have the intention of making something, but the user wants something completely different. But what do we like? Where is that uh, in in the Venn diagram? What is the overlap? Right. So that is that is something. These are the answers that you would get if you would map your user's journey. Um, I'll, I I want to leave you with with some some questions that uh you know uh you should ask once you've done uh you know the loop of experimentation and learning a few times because these are these these are questions that uh you will come across uh once you've done that loop a few times right so what is the shelf life of your story like i said earlier you know we decided that we wanted to build an inventory of video which is why uh we decided to create evergreen videos so if if your shelf life is uh you know two hours or one day, uh, then the effort you put into it does not necessarily match the shelf life. So please do keep in mind uh, that the longer the shelf life of your video, it'll, it'll, it'll help you uh, get in uh, a lot more viewers over the long term. For example, one of our videos that we made in 2016, 2018, uh, you know, two of these videos, they still get us new users, new views on a daily basis. Uh, so these, I mean, shelf life is something you need to, you need to look at very carefully. Uh, what action do you want your user to perform once they've watched your story? So do you want them to come back to your website? Do you want them to, uh, you know, go uh, take a survey? Do you want them, what, what is the action? Do you just want them to share? Do you want them to like? That, I mean, prompting a user to a particular action at the end of every video, uh, would really help whatever your goal is uh, for making that video, right? Uh, is your value proposition and takeaway very clear? So people uh, or other viewers are very, very, uh, are, are very, very discerning when it comes to, um, you know, because you're spending, it's, if, if, I mean, it's called the attention economy, right? So when you look at uh, where my attention is going on a daily basis. People don't want to waste their time on uh, doing something that wouldn't add value, right? You have you have Netflix. Your your mind space is going to Netflix. You're going to watching sports. You're watching TikTok videos. You're watching something else on YouTube. You have a long read that you've saved to pocket or whatever else, right? Your attention is being distributed across all these uh, like various platforms. So if your uh, value proposition and takeaway is not clear, A, the viewer can stop right there and move away. And they, they may not come back and, uh, you know, watch the other things, other, you know, nice and interesting and fun things that you may want to say. So make sure the right, uh, you know, your value proposition and takeaway is very, very clear in every video that you make. Uh, does your high, does your story have high or low cognitive load? And this is, this is such a huge point. Uh, when it comes to, again, like I said, you know, a, a, a viewer's attention is divided across so many platforms and so many things, not just uh, online, but also offline. We need to find a way to sort of balance the cognitive load. So if it's high cognitive load, when is the right time to, when is the right time according to your analytics to provide this information? You know, if it's low cognitive load, can I give it sort of seep it in through the day? So this is something uh, that you will also need to uh, address. Uh, does your writing or copy have suppositions? Uh, a lot of the time, 
you know, this, you know, my editor especially, always sort of, this is this is a standard question every time we write a script, is, you know, you, you may know something and you may come from your context, but does it mean that your viewer also understands or, uh, or shares that context? So always, you know, show your script or show your copy to someone else so that, uh, you know, some, some um, information that you may know or a context that you may have, uh, you know, may get answered if you show it to someone else. So, uh, yeah, suppositions is, is sort of, uh, you know, huge and, and uh, it can actually sort of kill or sort of make a video, right? Because you would assume that, uh, the, of course, the viewer knows something, but maybe they need a little bit more explanation, a little bit more context to what you're trying to say. And uh, of course, the last one is, does your story have hidden biases? And this is, of course, uh, huge. This would also uh, help. It would also help if you could share this with someone uh, who, who, again, does not come from your context, does not come from, uh, you know, supposed biases that you might have, and who could point these out uh, before you publish it and before uh, you put it out there in the world. So yes, so that's me. I've zoomed through this and I, I think, yeah, I have about a minute left, but you can reach me at sanutaitschool.in with any questions that you might have. I'm also on LinkedIn at Sanuta Raghu. Um, yes, and I hope this was useful. Thank you so much, Sanata, uh, for sharing these insights. I think we all consume video stories and it is incredible to see the work that goes behind creating these. Um, I'm sure that uh, many of you found this very useful. I'm just going to take a moment to circle back to the questions that we have opened. Sanata, do you want to take a look at the Q&A section and um, address some of these before we uh, sure. move on? I'm, I'm not able to, sorry, I'm not, I'm just going to, one second. Yes. Q a D. Um, okay, so there's a question about uh, 360 videos on the internet. Uh, so the problem with 360 videos, or I shouldn't call it problem, people will you know, sort of dismiss me. But essentially, the technology to view 360 videos um, is, is not as viewer friendly today as uh, one would like it to be. So the technology to produce 360 videos is uh, sort of way ahead of, uh, of, of uh, how people view it, which is why, and everybody, for example, does not have access to uh, you know, the glasses and things like that. So uh, 360 videos uh, will take some time, uh, but yeah, may not, may not. Again, the storytelling through 360 videos has been a little bit glitchy. I think the New York Times has tried it uh, and done a good job with it, but uh, the viewer experience still has a very, very long way to go. Um, yes, do we have anything else? We have a question on your tech stack and the softwares and apps that you all use. Yeah, so my tech stack for uh, editing um, videos is basically uh, the entire uh, Adobe, uh, the creative cloud. So we use Photoshop. Like I said, we have a very good graphic design team. So they work with Photoshop and After Effects. Uh, our editors use Premiere Pro. Uh, but but essentially, I'm in fact now training so uh, people to even work on a Windows Movie Maker and you know iMovie, for example. You don't really need a fancy software to uh, to make a video today. I mean, you know, so for example, GoPro has uh, a very good mobile app, free mobile app, which allows you to uh, you know make videos. It's all sort of uh, you know, custom and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very easy to, uh, it's, it's very easy to uh, work around. Also, there's a fantastic um, uh, shooting uh, app called Open Camera, 
which if, if you do mobile journalism and if you work with mobile phones to shoot your video, what it does is essentially because, you know, we multitask with our mobile phones. So what it essentially does is uh, it tells you how much space uh, your uh, phone has, you know, to make sure that uh, you're able to shoot video while not having to delete the other things that you have on your phone. And uh, it also has a bunch of uh, sort of uh, manual modes that you can play around with. And I, I use open camera uh, a lot to shoot videos. That's really useful to know. I'm sure everybody found this uh, very useful. And I hope that many of you listening uh, today to this session will experiment with uh, telling stories in the video format whether you create narrative ones, informative ones, interview style ones, um, sure these tips are going to be helpful and we're going to look forward to what you create.
In the session coming up right now, I have the great pleasure to welcome Thomas Bohm. Uh, he is a, a brilliantly qualified special guest for the Storytelling Festival and for this gala. He has been Iceland's guest of honor at the Frankfurt Buchmesse, the Frankfurt Book Fair, some years ago. Since 2014, Thomas has hosted a literary podcast, and he's organized readings and literary discussions since 1999, I believe, um, with some world famous and amazing authors uh, from all over the world, including Wuhan Pamuk and one of my personal contemporary favorite authors, Karl Ove Nausgaard. In 2020, uh, Thomas initiated and curated a project called Time to Listen for the Goethe Institute. And in this session, Thomas is going to share with us an uh, inside story about that project. And we will also have some Q&A. So I will hand the floor to Thomas in the moment and remind you that you're very welcome to use the chat to comment. And please use the Q&A function in Zoom to, uh, to share your questions that you would like uh, Thomas to answer or for he and I to discuss. So without further ado, Thomas, welcome and I will give you the floor. Thank you very much, Douglas. I hope you can see me now. We can. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you. So after this uh, very kind introduction by you, uh, I thought I'd give you a, a different story, uh, which gives you a little bit of uh, my background and tells you why it was a female werewolf that finally brought us together here. Um, I'd like to tell you about me um, growing up as a son of a coal miner from a, from a coal miner's family in the Ruhr Valley uh, in Western Germany. And uh, when I grew up, we didn't have any books at home, literally none. No of, none of my family was a reader. And then one night I was uh, 12 years old my father returned from work and he had a white plastic bag. And there was something inside I couldn't see. Uh, my father said he organized that. The word organizing uh, in our family and uh, the miners community meant something like um, swapping things uh, against other things which had fallen from a lorry, got missed somehow, and no one um, was missing them, or they were bluntly stolen. So my father had this plastic bag, put it into a corner of the room and said, you will not going to touch this. And as we all know, this is the worldwide formula for you're going to do something forbidden. So that night when my mother and my father had left, I jumped to that white plastic bag and found a large number of cheap novels inside. Crime novels, Western stories. And then all of a sudden I saw a novel, very thin one, 64 pages and the cover said is what it was from the series called John Sinclair, the ghost hunter of Scotland Yard. And that special book was called Lupina, the queen of the werewolves. And the cover showed a woman in the moment of transforming from a human being to a werewolf. She was half naked, but the most interesting part of her body were already covered in fur. Completely uh, irresistible. As you can imagine, I read this one uh, in one go, two or three hours, as I said, uh, only 64 pages. And uh, that made me a reader because for the next three years, I would read nothing but John Sinclair, the ghost hunter from, from uh, Scotland Yard. From the reader, I became a student. I studied literature. I became an organizer myself. 
And uh, as Douglas said, I was uh, involved in guest of honor campaigns at, at Frankfurt Book Fair. Um, for example, with uh, Norway in 2019. And this Norwegian guest of honor campaign was partly organized by the Goethe Institute in Oslo. The Goethe Institute is the official German cultural institute uh, financed by the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The Goethe Institute has branches in many countries of the world, branches which offer uh, lessons in le learning German. They, uh, in many cases, they have a big library of uh, German literature and they do from time to time exhibitions uh, from every field of, uh, of German culture. So um, we did this guess of honor campaign and uh, in spring 2020, we were thinking about what can we do as a follow up? And um, to be open, I can't remember uh, a single idea of any project we developed at the time, which is to say, so abruptly came the new situation we all were confronted with by uh, the COVID epidemic. And for all of us, it completely changed the thinking, what can we do next? What can we, uh, what can we do uh, sensible in this situation? In a situation in which we all um, found ourselves submitted to bad news all day long, um, to a complexity, um, to being uh, staring at the screen for uh, many hours a day. And we were thinking about what can we do? What can, what can we do simply against this complexity? What can we do to contrast the bad news? And the ever so simple idea we came up was, let's collect some good stories. Good stories just to give people a break for some minutes to listen to something different. And we had a kind of role model um, for this idea that was Boccaccio's De Camarone, this novel which begins with this harsh depiction of the plague. And then after that, uh, it's a collection of beautiful stories, witty stories about life, about love, about sex. So let's take this idea, let's take this energy and uh, make use of this worldwide network of uh, the Goethe Institute and invite authors from all over the world to tell a good story. It may be a story they experienced, it may be a story they wrote, it may be a story they read. And in a few weeks time, we had a number of stories, stories like that. And I would like to show you the first video, the first good story now. And I hope it's playing. to Mexico was about seven years ago and it was a, an amazing experience for me as a writer. Uh, many people came to the events and it was all very exciting and after the events uh, uh, I would do book signings and uh, at some stage uh, a person who was in the queue, a very tall guy with big mustache, asked me something in Spanish and usually in book signings, when somebody asks you something in a language you don't understand, it, it means that he wants to have a selfie with you. So I immediately said, yes, yeah, see, of course, and waited for that selfie. But when I stood up for the selfie, the guy, uh, instead of taking out his camera or, or his iPhone, he just uh, gave me a, a big hug. 
And I was petrified for a second because, you know, it's not every day that a, a tall Mexican with a mustache give me a big hug. But I said, okay, you know, it was just this one strange incident. But as the two went on, almost every book signing that I did, at least one person would come to me, ask me something in Spanish which I, wouldn't, I didn't understand. And when I said yes, would basically hug me. And uh, when my publisher uh, took me to the airport, when I finished the tour, I said to him, you know, I've traveled uh, as a writer to so many countries and I've never been in a place as amazing and warm, especially as, Mex as Mexico. It's a heaven for writers. And he asked me why. And I said, you know, because every uh, reading event we had here, somebody hugged me. And this is something that uh, is, uh, must be a very pe a particular Mexican phenomena because it never happened to me in any other country. And he looked at me and he said, well, this doesn't uh, happen in Mexico too. You know, we don't hug writers. And I said to him, but you were with me in all these events. You, you saw those people hugging me. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't hug writers. We hug you. And I said to him, why, why would people hug me? Why does it make sense? how does it make sense? And he thought for a moment and he said, well, I guess that uh, any person who really reads your, your books uh, seriously, when he finishes the book, he says to himself, man, this guy must need a hug. Watching this, this is the next one. Watching uh, this video, um, you uh, immediately get an idea how simply we kept this project. We uh, send a so short manual to the participants and uh, asking them to use their own devices, uh, their cell phones and so on and so on. Um, as we all know, the pandemic brought uh, a change in the understanding uh, of uh, the quality uh, uh, of films and so on and so on. Uh, before the, the, the pandemic, um, we had the idea of high resolution um, standards of sound and vision in the cultural context, um, unlike uh, in the news where uh, the authenticity and the direct contact uh, meant more. And now we've uh, also in the cultural sector, uh, we de developed the fact that communication is uh, much more important than uh, standards of um, high res uh, standards of high resolution. Uh, another thing which is uh, worth mentioning is um, that um, there is an element of solidarity uh, in this project. Uh, I won't name any of uh, the around 80 authors from all over the world which participated so far. Uh, on the one hand, I want you to discover uh, the list of uh, uh, authors yourself by going to our uh, web page. Uh, on the other hand, it's like um, whoever I regard to be famous, maybe a Nobel, Prize, a Nobel laureate uh, or made the best-selling author. If he or she may be famous from my Berlin German point of view and mean nothing to you and vice versa, there may be authors participating uh, who are stars in your country and completely unknown here in, um, in, Ger in Germany. Um, so uh, when we asked the authors from which we thought as they were best-selling authors to be well off. We told them that they won't get a honorarium for participating, simply what does uh, 500 euros, 1000 euros mean to them. But on the other hand, in some countries in that situation where authors couldn't work, couldn't write 500 and 1000 euros, and I don't want to sound arrogant, could make a major change, could uh, 
pay for a living in two or three months uh, for two or three months or something like that. So uh, those authors uh, who are better off um, easily agreed uh, of donating their honorarium or not getting any honorarium um, for contributing uh, uh, in, uh, in the project. So that brought us over the first three months. And uh, we hope like everybody that uh, the pandemic would end sooner or later. It didn't. So uh, in the fall of 2020, we knew we had to go into a next round, which was uh, ever so easy for us because some of the authors we had invited in spring took the opportunity to develop uh, very delicate contributions. Uh, contributions which reflect um, the um, relationship uh, of storytelling, um, of depiction of the video, uh, the picture and the voice and the story and so on and so on. And also going after three months, going deeper into the pandemic situation, uh, which confronted all of us month by month with even stronger emotions, with new rules, uh, with new contradictions. And the video you are not going to, uh, you are now going to see is masterfully woven out of all these ideas. It's going to last five minutes and it holds a number of surprises. <laughs> J'avais bravé le chemin parsemé de barrières qui nous séparaient. J'étais parvenu de manière étonnamment facile jusqu'à son domicile. Il m'a pris dans ses bras pour me saluer. Il sentait bon. Une huile qu'il avait ramenée d'Éthiopie il y avait quelques mois, je pense. Je me suis laissé emporter quelques secondes. Ensuite, j'ai fait une blague pour secouer la délicieuse torpeur qui me gagnait à son contact. Je suis une spécialiste du saut d'émotion. Il faut surtout éviter de perdre le contrôle de certaines situations. Il ne fallait pas qu'on oublie pourquoi nous étions là. Il fallait à tout prix mettre une pause à la solitude et aux pensées noires. Il y en avait des roses, des vertes et des pas mûres aussi, mais pour l'instant, la compagnie d'un être tangible était devenue un besoin essentiel. Il nous fallait l'ivresse du toucher, une drogue qui était devenue illicite. Il fallait s'économiser, y aller étape par étape pour être sûr d'essorer le moment jusqu'à la dernière goutte de future nostalgie. Je suis allée à la cuisine nous servir à boire pendant qu'il préparait le dîner. Comme à son habitude, il avait fait un repas rapide et improvisé, d'une main qui dansait des gestes sans effort, avec la grâce de l'assurance. Il savait que peu importe l'expérience qu'il entreprendrait, je serais comblée et je me resservirais. Je l'observais s'affairer, silencieusement appuyé sur la table en face de l'évier. La vaisselle était empilée dans une vision d'horreur qui aurait tout autant pu être une œuvre d'art contemporaine, reflétant l'abdication de soi-même. Je savais pertinemment que c'était la première fois qu'il cuisinait en plusieurs semaines. Il faisait partie de ces personnes qui donnent aux autres ce qu'ils se refusent eux-mêmes sans hésiter. L'historique de ses livraisons à domicile gisait dans la poubelle en dessous de l'évier. J'ai été tentée de nettoyer, il m'en a empêché. La femme de ménage viendrait lundi. On était samedi soir. Je ne me suis pas empêchée de me demander par où elle passerait avec les flics qui grouillaient partout. J'ai détourné mon attention de la scène fascinante de chaos pour continuer à le regarder. Je ressentais une chaleur euphorisante se balader sans autorisation à l'intérieur de ma poitrine, en se hasardant même à glisser plus bas. C'était un moment banal, d'une grande qualité, comme on peut en apprécier dans les temps de confusion et d'incertitude. Nous nous sommes permis de nous voir pour célébrer ensemble les résultats négatifs de nos tests au virus géolier qui incarcèrent le monde entier en ce moment. J'avais espéré en vain que le sujet ne revienne pas sur le tapis. Il a accaparé le plus clair de la soirée, sous forme d'un concert en charité 
sous forme d'un concert de charité en ligne organisé par Lady Gaga. Des artistes mondialement reconnus, méconnaissables dans leur apparence de tous les jours, qui chantaient dans leur salon. Je l'ai enduré en sirotant mon vin plus rapidement que de coutume. Je ne pouvais plus souffrir d'entendre les mêmes slogans, le même sujet, aborder du même angle, chacun chez soi, laver les mains régulièrement, faire les parodies de nos chansons préférées pour faire face au déroutement général, partout. Le monde virtuel où nous habitions tous désormais était plus infecté que des roues, que les rues qu'on fouillait. Finalement, mon supplice a pris fin avec le concert et nous avons pu enfin écouter du jazz gitan. Nous étions déjà pompettes et pour imiter le temps présent qui s'était extrait du temps manufacturé, nous flottions. Comme des météorites dans un espace mental qui s'était dilaté, dilaté sur plusieurs étendues du jour au lendemain. Contrairement aux astéroïdes, nous avions une idée plus ou moins concrète d'où nous atterririons. La pièce était rouge. Nous avions fini les deux bouteilles de vin et entamé la grande traversée vers le whisky. Au moment où j'allumais ma centième cigarette, il m'a demandé si je danserais pour lui, les seins nus. Je n'ai pas objecté. Je trouvais que la situation s'y prêtait parfaitement. Comme dans tous les temps de guerre, j'ai remis mes talons rouges que j'avais ôtés en arrivant et j'ai décrafé le haut de ma robe, retiré mon soutien-gorge et puis je me suis mis en face du projecteur qui nous avait servi à visionner le, con le concert. Je me suis offerte à la sensualité du moment, en donnant mon corps à la musique et à la lumière. Langoureusement, j'ai dansé, pénétré par la fatalité qui caractérisait l'époque que nous vivions. And with every video we, rece we received, um, we became more happy uh, getting another aspect of, like it was put here in this video, another aspect of the area, the area we are living in. So ever since then, we collected uh, around 80 videos from all over the world in many, many different languages from various uh, communities. And uh, we had to restructure um, the web page. Uh, we turned it into what we like to think as a museum uh, of stories with various uh, rooms. And uh, ever since then, um, we found uh, various occasions on which we uh, collect new stories For example, uh, the um, book fair in Abu Dhabi will be one of these um, occasions in which we will collect uh, new stories from the Arabic world to um, include uh, into our uh, museums of stories. And uh, to come to a conclusion, um, looking back, watching these uh, videos, um, if you take an hour to do so and just uh, follow your uh, uh, follow your uh, inspiration uh, the intuition uh, of the moment you will get the idea that you hardly come that you hardly uh, ever seen a project which is that international including so many different voices so many uh, different stories for me this is um, it's it's a a model of what global literature project may be. And if I say model, uh, I mean, I'm not proud of this because but, uh, I just want to say, here, take it, take the idea, take it over, do uh, with it whatever you like. And, um, and also um, what I gain personally from it is um, there are so many wonderful stories and I do not, I'm not going to explain Uh, what a video like the one we see uh, is telling me. There are so many wonderful, heartwarming stories 
which fulfilled the original, original idea uh, of the project. Just give you some few minutes to be somewhere else. And these few minutes, which I once spent with the female werewolf, led to somehow the energy to create 20, 30, 40 years later, a project like this. And this is on a bigger scale. And the uh, story I want to share with you to close this presentation tells you how little things planted may lead to future pleasures. Please. <laughs>
from my mom um, when I was an adult was many years ago. That was when my ex-girlfriend um, came to visit her for the first time. Of course, she knew you were coming. I guess she had anticipation. Still, when these two women, some 30 years apart, standing on two sides of a door frame, and immediately my ex stepped up and hugged my mom. That was a surprise to her. And I couldn't figure out what it, what it did to her. At least at the time, she appeared really happy. Years later, um, 2018, I came back home for New Year again. And when I left, um, they proposed to send me away uh, at the airport. And I said, no, it's really far away, you don't have to. But they insisted. So we went to the airport together. And they had to stop at the security check. And I thought we would wave goodbye as usual. Or just say goodbye. Uh, but my mom suggested a hug. And that seized me in an instant. I didn't know how to react. Of course, very soon I came back um, then I, to the moment I, and I hugged her. And that was my first hug with my mom as an adult. Later, I also hugged my dad. It was, for the two of us, a bit somehow awkward. It was also the first time that we hugged. And I went to a security check and, you know, the steps down the way, and I looked back and checked on them all the time. They were all the time standing there where they were until they vanished from my sight. And at that moment, I sensed a burst of tears coming here, and I couldn't help. When I arrived, we become some 700 kilometers apart and we had video chats, of course, like everybody else does. And this virtual connection somehow became physical with this hugging or with this ritual of saying goodbye. It became tangible. Please, um, if you imagine, please imagine a piece of ramen. And that is how I felt. How much did it take to stretch one singular continuous piece of dough over the time zones of seven hours. Uh, by the way, if you're interested, that artwork is done by um, Rafael Ibarra. So that was a hidden way to say hugs to all of you. And um, whenever there are when, when there are questions and uh, questions or comments or whatever, I'm gladly will answer them. Thank you, Thomas. That was wonderful. Uh, what an amazing project, and uh, I love those stories. Uh, now, as we are monitoring the chat and the Q&A, 
I have a couple of questions to kick yes, off please. with, if I may. Yes, please. You spoke first about, I called it the plastic bag moment. <laughs> as, a, <laughs> as a boy, I think you uh, yeah, discovered that intriguing sounding novel, The Ghost Hunter of Scotland Yard, um, in a white plastic bag that maybe you weren't supposed to open and you mm. got hooked into literature, mm. reading mm. books and culture. And I, I love that story. And I'm wondering now, in a different age, in a very, very digital age where we're constantly surrounded yeah. by images, information, mo mobile devices, mm. our phones are never far away. Where do you mm. think people today might experience their own plastic bag moments? Well, um, this is, for sure, it's, it's a difficult question. Um, and as I'm a father of uh, two daughters who are 16 and 12 years old, and you know, this is the problem I'm facing almost every day. But still, um, uh, I told this story um, because I wanted to tell you that stories can be found everywhere, you know, in a cheap plastic bag, in a cheap novel. So uh, where can people... Uh, find their plastic bag moment everywhere. There must be, uh, it, it can be everywhere, you know. I'm not a cultural criticist uh, saying uh, you can't find them on here and there and there. Every, everywhere you find something that touches your heart and you find it worth spending your time with for at least for a start. And then there is something in it, a substance, you know, which gives you energy which uh, allows you to see the world from a different kind of uh, angle, uh, or maybe just helps you to escape your world, to build up a world of your own. Wherever that's the case, you may find your plastic bag. And uh, you will tell after, after some uh, period of time if it's worthwhile spending your time with what you discovered. And if it enriches you, you know, who are uh, we to, uh, 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 um, to, 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 to judge over what people uh, uh, regard as their plastic uh, bag moment? <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. And in the audience today, we have lots of creators, artists, and storytellers spent many hours, I'm sure, happy. Uh, days talking with authors at book signings, fest and interviews. And how do you think that the line, you know, would we look back, for example, despite all of the awful things that happened as the working from home or being trapped at home in the lockdown world as a, a different environment and a, a different kind of age for authors, uh, what, what are your observations about the life of... Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, I, I have to tell you that I'm going to contradict myself. I'm going to contradict myself. I just depicted me as an open-minded, uh, non-judging cultural, non-cultural critic. But um, I, uh, I kind of not liked uh, that um, video screening conversations that much because um, being an, an organizer of literary event uh, and everyone who ever attended one knows it's, a, it's um, rarely addressed but each and every live event is, uh, is carried by energy you know a reading is carried by energy um, the author reads something and he or she uh, immediately senses out uh, how the, the audience is going to react. This is the per performative event uh, uh, element uh, of readings. And, uh, and as we uh, during uh, or uh, hardly ever spoke about the quality of literary events, we did never uh, brought up um, the subject of what is the quality uh, of this video events either. Um, so let's talk about it. Let's, let's find ways and dis discuss on, on, on a, on a uh, broad scale 
how can we increase the quality uh, 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 and, and what could be parts and uh, how can we exchange ideas instead of, you know, each and everyone does it um, on their own homemade bl uh, blah, blah, blah. So um, yes, it's going to be, it's going to be, uh, we will look back at this time as a new era. Um, I, I, there were, I, I would say, uh, under the circumstances, uh, it served us well. Um, I didn't like it, but, big but, um, it will help us in the future. Because um, when talking about literary events, um, we have the same, if, if, uh, if you take uh, literary festivals, all, of, all the festivals all over the world, they will invite the same 40, 50 top authors which are worldwide known. And uh, like Paul Oster once said to me, sorry for boasting about this quote, once said to me, uh, the sun is shining uh, 24 hours at the earth. And in this, in, in, any, in one place in which the sun is shining, somebody gets the idea, let's invite Paul Auster to come. So um, with, uh, um, so, um, but facing climate change, uh, uh, it's, it's bizarre, it's stupid to have authors flying around uh, all over the world. You know, so we have to come up with new ideas, new ideas of festivals like the one you're hosting now, hybrid festivals, uh, hybrid forms uh, in which we can use uh, these new technical means to really create global dialogue. And uh, I hope this is what will come out of this past uh, two years, new ideas, new formats, new ways of uh, connecting people from all over the world. Wonderful. And I have one last question for you before we wrap up. Is uh, We have many cultural heritage colleagues, friends, professionals also in the audience. How do you think that libraries, archives and museums can adapt and can enter this conversation, this democracy of storytelling that you described today? Mm -hmm. um, I think that everyone who is in storytelling and uh, loves libraries, you know, because they know this, this is the, the big archive, uh, the big human archive of, 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 storytelling, uh, of, of storytelling. And I would uh, suggest um, get uh, each and every archive, each and, each and every library, get in contact with, uh, with authors uh, because they have a natural, uh, a natural feeling of belonging to you make them patrons where you don't have done it so far, make them patrons of your institutions uh, to attract more uh, public awareness, uh, more publicity, so to say. Uh, uh, find new ways with those living storytellers to um, open up the treasures of your cultural heritage. And then you will uh, uh, channel new public uh, attendance uh, to your archives. Wonderful. That's the perfect way to close the session, Thomas. So <laughs> thank you so much again. I've loved it. I'm sure our audience has loved it. And anyone that gives a shout out to libraries is always uh, a friend of Europeana. So thank you again. Thank you. I'm now going to pass over to my colleague, Maggie, who will introduce the next session. And Maggie. So hello everyone. A warm welcome to anyone joining us just right now for the Digital Storytelling Festival opening gala. My name is Becky and I'm the Exhibition and Content Coordinator at European Foundation. In this next session, we will be focusing on the storytelling used for educating the public, especially in the context of health and sexual education. Uh, we will be hearing from two great speakers who create uh, educative content uh, in a two different, but both digital formats. On one side, you will discover in-depth online exhibition about contraception. And on the other, we'll be discussing a social media channel dedicated to public medical education. Um, at the end of the session, we're gonna have a Q&A. So 
please uh, put your questions to the speakers uh, in the area specific for the Q&A. Okay, so now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to our speakers. First, we will hear from uh, Margot Nelson, who at the moment combines her interest of museums and uh, history working as a researcher at the In Flanders Fields Museum in Belgium, where she focuses on the World War I cemeteries. However, when pursuing her master's degree in cultural studies from K. Leuven, Margot, to, together with the, uh, five other ambitious students, uh, curated a digital exhibition on the revolutionary impact of the birth control field. Uh, this was framed as a game changer in the uh, 20th century. And I'm very, uh, very, very happy and proud uh, because that, this exhibition in its renewed version was just published on Europeana in March as part of our uh, Women's History Month celebration. So you will learn more about the story of the Pill Expo in a moment. And uh, Marvo, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so yes, today I'm here to talk about the uh, project I uh, did with uh, five other students last year. Um, I think you can immediately, immediately go to the next slide. Um, so the, the first question maybe is how did we get to curate a, a whole exhibition as students? Um, I enrolled in the uh, Master of Cultural Studies and one of the compulsory courses is cult cultural policy. Um, and that course is, in, uh, is actually one big group project. Um, they are very diverse, um, but they, are, they always have a link with the cultural sector. Um, so um, maybe I can introduce, introduce my uh, colleague students from last year um, who sadly couldn't be here today. Um, Sophie and I are both uh, Belgian. Um, Alexandra and Helene, they were from uh, Greece and Scarlett and Xinghan were Chinese uh, students. Um, and together we created the exhibition, um, but due to Corona, we couldn't meet uh, physically. So we did everything uh, online. So the, the whole project was one big digital uh, challenge. Um, I think you can go to, uh, no, maybe first this, the um, project was guided by um, Professor Fred Treyen and Sophie Taat, and um, it was part of the larger Europeana XX uh, century of change project and um, the only task we got was to create a digital exhibition on something that we thought was a game changer in the 20th century. Um, so the first big decision we had to make was to decide on the topic and I think therefore you can go to the next slide. Um, and there are many game changers in the 20th century, um, but we wanted to pick something that um, we could make an impact with, but also uh, tell a story people could relate to. Uh, and actually quite, um, quite fast, we decided that the birth control pill was uh, the ideal topic to do that. Um, since it was something that um, was revolutionary, um, but was not, um, simple to get the rights to. Um, so women had to fight to be able to take the pill. Um, it was, and sometimes still is, um, controversial. Um, so for us, it was um, the perfect topic to, to tell a story with, uh, a story that I think uh, uh, every woman can relate to. Um, but we wanted to go a step further than uh, only talk why the pill was revolutionary. We also wanted to um, raise awareness and um, pay a lot of attention to um, the shortcomings and um, the social concerns uh, on taking the pill. Um, the expo is divided in four chapters and I think therefore you can go to the next slide. Um, the first chapter focuses on the history of the pill. Um, how was um, birth control before the invention of the pill? How did the pill originate? Um, in the second chapter, we mainly focus on the religious and societal concerns um, and challenges that uh, originated when the pill was invented. Um, the third chapter um, focuses on feminism and emancipation. We talk about um, I think three pioneer figures, um, but also how the pill can be emancipating and in which ways it is not. 
Um, for example, um, asking ourselves the question, why do women have to take the pill? Why is the, the male pill taking so long? Um, and the last chapter was very important to make that impact uh, that we set as a goal for ourselves. Um, how the, the pill uh, impacts the individual lives of uh, women. Um, it, it lets them decide if and when they want to become a mother. But as said before, there are a lot of side effects and uh, risks, sometimes deadly risks um, to taking the pill. So that was one of the main um, aspects that we really wanted to handle um, in this exhibition. Um, now, now we have a, a story. Um, but we still don't have an exhibition. Um, and I think therefore you can go to the next slide. Um, deciding um, how to, which formats to use for the exhibition was very challenging um, since neither of us were any, uh, had any experience with working with computer pro programs or, or program languages, creating websites. Um, so we decided to use uh, Google Sites as a format. Um, it allowed us to make a visually attractive um, but also interactive um, exhibition free of any charge uh, so we didn't have to pay anything to create this website um, and I can show you uh, the ways in which it's interactive if you can click on the picture of um, on the picture on top um, it normally should go to the website yes this one um, if you go to the a little bit um, lower you see that um, a little bit more that the pictures are uh, visible but to read the uh, text that accompany them you have to click on the titles that are above them and if you go down below completely um, google sites also allows you to make a picture roulette uh, so you can um, put a lot of pictures uh, on the same topic without making it visually overwhelming that you, you see a ton of pictures immediately um, the middle one, if you click, you get another picture, um, which makes it also kind of interactive for the visitors, even though it is not a physical exhibition. Um, I think you can go back to the presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, all the pictures that are shown, of, or the largest majority of them, um, you can find in the large collection of Europeana. And, um, we try to use as many um, pictures as possible that don't have any rights to them, so they are freely usable. Um, the, we also indicated every time uh, if there were rights on the picture, so if people want to use our um, exhibition, they can find it easily uh, what is allowed and what is not. Um, Next to that, next to the exhibition, we also had to make a presentation. And again, due to Corona, we couldn't do it physically. So it has to, uh, had to happen digitally. Um, we created an, a virtual reality teaser for that. Um, and I, if you click on the title, Curating a Digital Exhibition, um, it shows you a short clip of um, how we did that. Um, you can mute the sound. Uh, we discussed how people control pregnancy. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we used uh, the um, Art Steps program for that. It's a free tool, an online tool, and um, you can create your own virtual museum with that. So outside, we um, used our banners from the website, and I did a little vo voiceover for the for the presentation, explaining what uh, each chapter discusses. And then, if you go a little bit further in the video, you enter the building, uh, which was pre-made in the program, so I only had to add um, our own pictures uh, to it. And you see uh, a, a selection, a small selection of the, the a little bit back maybe, um, of the, the, the pictures of the exhibition uh, with a little bit of explanation to it. Um, so that's very fun to make, very easy to make uh, too. Um, and it gives an, it's, it's a nice extra touch to a digital exhibition, makes it more physical, even though it's completely online. Um, can you go back to the presentation? Thank you. Um, so now we, we have an exhibition, and um, but we still need vis visitors for that. And the last part of our project um, was communication. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? 
we decided to communicate our um, exhibition uh, completely online. We didn't, didn't make any physical flyers uh, or anything. We mainly focused on social media. Um, we made a Facebook page, an Instagram page, and a Twitter page, and we uh, designed our own posters uh, to share. It was my, um, my friend Xing Han who did that. Um, so the, the poster you see uh, on the side is one uh, she made uh, for her launch. Um, we shared them there, but we also had to make a compulsory blog text, which was um, shared on the, um, the website of cultural studies. And thanks to Sophie Taz, we could also uh, share a short article on the uh, educational portal of Photo Consortium, uh, which was very exciting for us. Um, so that's the, the way we communicated our exhibition. And actually, I checked the visitors um, numbers the first few days after the launch. Um, and quite fast, we got a lot of uh, international visitors from very different countries, from the United States to Turkey, uh, to China, um, everywhere around the world. Uh, we, we reached people with, with our exhibition, uh, which was very nice. Um, so on the last slide, I shared um, the links to the original um, exhibition we made as students, um, but also the renewed exhibition uh, that Europeana made for Women's History Month and the pro article they wrote um, for uh, the pro community of Europeana. So uh, I hope this was uh, clear. Uh, and if there are any questions, please ask. Thank you, Marho. That was very clear, great presentation. Let's uh, hear from uh, Dr. Tanaya uh, Narenda. Uh, Tanaya is a medical doctor, gynecologist in training, uh, and a scientist passionate about medical education. Uh, you might know her from her successful Instagram and YouTube channel as Dr. Cuterus. Uh, for which she was awarded Influencer of the Year 2020 by uh, SH24, the online sexual health partner at the National Health Service in UK. Uh, after her master's uh, studies at the University of Oxford, she registered as a doctor in UK and committed to making public medical education her life goal. Uh, so, uh, Tanaya, please take the floor. Hi there. I'm just checking if my audio and video are coming on fine. It sounds great. So perfect. Perfect. So hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be speaking here about how to make education using social media a little bit more accessible. And um, it is a very relevant tool in today's age, especially given how every everybody has a mobile phone and they have a data connection wi-fi is free in most places and um we're already spending so much time on the phone so if we can include bite-sized messages about health and important precautions people can take to ensure better health especially everything we've seen post pandemic i think it's a very effective medium so uh, if you could just move on to the next slide please Okay, so just a quick introduction about me. My name is Dr. Tanaya. I, I did my medical training in India and then I did a master's uh, in the UK, registered as a doctor in the UK and saw a very different side of medicine, which sort of inspired me to make more accessible, um, patient-friendly, jargon-free information available for people. And from there, we've built up a community of close to a million people now. So it's very, very in, uh, exciting. It's very, very inspiring for me, myself, and it's very humbling as well. Um, if you could just move on to the next slide. Uh, I was sort of in the space of thinking about there's so many doctors coming on on social media nowadays, and we're seeing so many different branches. You have everything from, say, anesthesia to sexual health to gynecology to plastic surgeons. Everybody is sharing how they work, what are the miracles they see in their department, and, you know, what, what are the kind of um, transformations we've seen personally as doctors in our different fields with the pandemic. So 
there is a lot of things that have changed. And one of the best things that has come in is that more health content is available with more and more doctors and scientists and, you know, uh, subject matter experts coming on board. So if you could just move on to the next slide. So um, how I started my journey was actually really <laughs> silly. I was using a menstrual cup and uh, this was 2017. India didn't really have that many menstrual cups available at that time. So every time I would fly back to India, I would be carrying 10 or 15 cups with me. And, uh, you know, one of these times I was in India, I was at home and both my parents are fertility doctors. So we had a uterus model lying around and it was World Menstrual Hygiene Day in 2019. I saw the uterus model and I was like, I could use this to explain very, very simply to my friends on my personal Instagram on how a menstrual cup works. I did that and I got a really, really positive response from everyone, which, and, you know, basically everybody encouraged me to make a separate account and make this information public. And from there, I really started to talk more about um, periods and menstrual health. And eventually it moved on into more of my deeper passions like sexual health. And um, it was a bit difficult to maintain it for the first year. I was working towards getting my license to work as a doctor in the UK. And uh, I would be... I didn't really know the right language to use. I was still using more technical terms and, you know, I made a lot of mistakes, but from 2020 onwards, I started being more consistent with sharing this information. And th that's where I really developed a language and I really developed um, the best protocol that I continue to follow to this day on how to effectively share medical messages on social media. Uh, next slide, please. So, one of the best things that I have found as a platform on Instagram, so again, YouTube, Instagram, both of these platforms have been wonderful. I don't use Facebook, so I don't know how you can use it there, but I'm sure they'll have these features. So it's not just, it's not like a boring lecture, you know, it's not somebody going on for half an hour about explaining something very, very technical. It's usually very bite-sized pieces of information. It will be 10 slides. It will be one picture with three paragraphs. It will be a 60 second video. So because of the um, short time frame, you also have to be a little bit more creative, sure. But there's also such a good medium of transmitting very important small pieces of information that can have a huge impact. Along with this, there's also other options on, say, a platform like Instagram or YouTube where you can do polls, so you can figure out what kind of information people are looking for, what are the practices they follow in their life, and maybe, you know, you can step in and give them an idea on, this is how I have done this, or this is how you have done this for so many years, but this is actually what the science says, and this is how you can do it. Um, along with this, quizzes are extremely fun people really enjoy that there is that gamification of the information process which i think is absolutely wonderful duolingo does it and um, that's where i learned this idea and you know it, it sort of treats your reward system in the brain as well so every time you you click the correct answer after following somebody's content for a while you feel very nice because you're getting rewarded for knowing the right information so the interactive aspect really, really adds to um, making education more accessible. Nobody likes exams, but people do love fun quizzes. So if you can add an element of gamification, jokes, memes, all of these things are very, very effective tools of really transmitting your message. And this is what I've seen so far that um, some of the most widely reaching messages I have had in terms of my content have usually been a little bit more lighthearted in terms of the delivery, um, even, though, even though the content might be extremely serious. So incorporating some humor, we all know, has been very, very useful as a technique throughout history for uh, passing on information, making sure people remember it, and of course, making it small and concise. Next slide, please. So again, <laughs> I will 
drive home this point as many times as I possibly can. Keep it short. If you are trying to create engaging uh, content, educational content for anybody, if you're trying to tell a story through your, uh, an educational through, a story through your content, don't write 15 paragraphs because we live in the age of extremely limited time spans. 15 second TikToks are the thing that is working right now. So anything that grabs the attention of the viewer in the first five seconds, that's when, you know, just pique their curiosity in the first five seconds. Use those five seconds very, very effectively and then deliver your message. But with that message, it has to be extremely crucial that that message is easy to understand. This is particularly important for people who are coming from more technical fields like, say, medicine, or if you're trying to communicate, I don't know, a complicated um, topic in physics or anything. Just if, if there's, or maybe, you know, a very rich history um, of a place or of an object. The minute we get so technical, it's very easy to lose interest. The minute you use heavy jargon that only people from that certain field can understand, you're already limiting the access people are going to have. The beauty of using social media as an educational tool is the access and the inclusivity of it. So try to keep the language easy and completely jargon-free. Humor and making it interactive are absolutely brilliant ways of keeping your audience engaged and curious and if they're engaged and curious they'll ask more questions which will lead to more dialogue and isn't that what we're trying to establish with educating people so um i mean this is a lot of things <laughs> and it can be quite overwhelming when you have to keep all of these things in mind when you're designing any kind of educational um, information or content uh, which is why a lot of people tend to get overwhelmed by the idea of making it perfect and um, kind of fizzle out in how often they share this or they post it, which is where uh, one thing I've learned, especially written right in front of me, I keep a sticky note that says this, it says progress, not perfection, which means you have to do a little bit every day. It doesn't matter if it doesn't look perfect. If you're making mistakes, just do it. Sometimes those mistakes are your best hits. A, eh? For example, my first video that hit a million views was where I ended up sneezing in the middle of the video. <laughs> and um, not just, um, not only do you learn from your mistakes, but you also get very effective tools on how to manage those mistakes and how to make sure those things don't happen, which lead to better practices for yourself and establishing your own brand, essentially. And that is extremely important because people relate to the storyteller so much. So having that personality come through and having that um, authenticity of yourself, not at trying to be somebody else come through is so, so important in effective storytelling and I feel like these are the best tips I can share for how you can engage people initiate conversations encourage conversations and lead to better education for everybody we have such an effective and easily accessible tool that I feel like if we all just share just one tiny piece of information that we find chilling personally about our own profession or work it would just make so much of a better social media experience in general. <laughs> That's all the information I had to share. Thank you so much. If I have, uh, if there's any questions that people would like to ask, I'd be very happy to answer. Thank you, Dr. Samaya. Uh, thank you both. That was a, that was a great presentation. Um, I Maybe I will start, uh, Marvo, uh, with you. Um, so, uh, you mentioned that choosing the pill as a topic was quite uh, uh, quite obvious. It wasn't. Um, it was very re relatable for you and um, and your colleagues. But what did you find the most challenging when you're creating the exhibition? Was it something on the technical side? Was it the I'm just brainstorming here, Corona, or uh, was it maybe something about the language that was particularly difficult in the topic? Um, I think the most challenging 
part was um, deciding what to tell about the pill. We 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 did, we came to the pill by brainstorming. We each wrote down um, some topics that were interesting to us, um, and then we we voted and. The pill was the only one who got all our votes, so it was something we really all stood behind. But the most challenging thing then was deciding how we will how will we bring the story. There are so many ways to to tell this story, um, but we really wanted to make an impact and and tell something that people could relate to. So then we came up with um, the idea to look for pictures first and see how the pictures could inspire us. So we collected as many pictures relating to the topic as possible. And that way we kind of put them together in little groups and came to the four chapters and then made a little selection of which ones would make it into the exhibition. And there the, the selection on which pictures would make it into the exhibition, the free of rights, the, the freely usable pictures um, was the main criteria because it was the easiest way and also um, we really focused on educators because we wanted to raise awareness and for them it's easy if they can reuse the pictures without having to look for rights or, or asking permission to different institutions and stuff. So that was kind of the whole process behind it. Right, but uh, yeah, the, the part about uh, educators reusing the content is very important. We also uh, like to uh, serve as a source for uh, for them in Europeana. Um, so that's very interesting because you so even with the, the format that you have that was quite uh, quite big, uh, let's say in depth, you still had to think uh, very much about what, uh, what are you choosing to communicate um, to the audience that's gonna see the exhibition. Um, and that yeah, links me, I think, to, uh, to Tanya. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, you mentioned that you, uh, well, you have a YouTube channel, of course, but your main operating ground, I think, your main classroom, if my, my <laughs> May is Instagram, right? And um, so as a social media educator, um, do you feel that this uh, medium, you mentioned this, it requires a certain adaptation, it requires to share the knowledge in bits. Do you feel that it is limiting you in any way or maybe on the contrary, it is just providing you with possibilities? Um, so if I were to educate somebody, say about some one of my personal passion projects has been uh, sharing information about the HPV vaccine. And I know at least 2,000 women who have gotten vaccinated after, uh, against the HPV virus after for, uh, viewing some of my content. So in order to find 2,000 women or maybe 4,000 women because only 50% of them would actually go and get the vaccine, find 4,000 people, sit with them, explain to every single one of them the details of how this vaccination works would take a very long time compared with the access on social media it's a free service and it, it just it, it provides a platform to broadcast your service so i do believe that it uh, has enabled us to share messages and make them viral in ways we've never seen before that's great great answer uh just out of curiosity can you share something about your audience demographic i don't know do you are there more women following you? Are this more young? I'm assuming there's going to be young people, my name, but it's an assumption. So <laughs> my main age group, interestingly, is between the age of 25 to 34. Mm -hmm. um, I've followed shortly by um, 18 to 24. And then about 60% women. I mean, it ranges. It's between 60 to 70% women. And then, yeah, it keeps fluctuating every now and then. Okay, so it's not, I mean, it's not a super young crowd. It's just a... Yeah, above 20, no. 25. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of uh, uh, relate to that because I also uh, follow uh, like the, the type of uh, Instagram accounts uh, from Poland, where uh, sexual education is not is, is basically non-existing, and uh, especially in twenty twenty, it creates this uh, this new opportunities, you know, of people sharing the knowledge. Um, so, yeah, that's. Uh, that's, yeah, but that's consistent with the audience that I see also, you know, and in other countries. Um, but let me ask you uh, maybe something uh, on the, I don't know how to call it, a little bit on the dark side. So uh, the, the sex ed and the reproductive health in general is still considered in many places a controversial topic. Um, so if 
if are you facing some kind of uh, problems with communicating it to the public? Um, is there, um, yeah, is, are there any challenges in that uh, in talking about the, the topic that might be considered uh, taboo for some people? So I'm currently living in the United States and I live in Texas, which is one of the more uh, regressive states in terms of these conversations. Um, I feel like uh, globally, there's very different responses to the kind of content I do. Um, very interestingly, I found more of a, a, I don't know, positive response in India compared to what I've seen over here. And uh, Definitely, yeah, there are some huge barriers in sharing this information, especially when it comes from a woman. People don't like that. Um, we are less often seen as authority figures. Um, and there's also a lot of questioning about morality and how dare you say this and things of that sort. But I also feel that um, as a woman, I can add a certain angle of empathy that maybe is a little bit more inherent to me than someone else, um, which does make the conversation easier. But I will be very, very honest in saying that, yes, there have been very bad instances of uh, trolling and abuse, but the response has overwhelmingly been positive wherever I've had this conversation. So there is this, um, there is this balance uh, that's like that, that the, the response of the audience is still making it worthwhile, right? So, absolutely um, great. So let me maybe, um, unless we have some uh, questions from the audience, I think my colleague can jump in in case. But let me uh, just um, maybe switch a little bit the conversation to like the the storytelling uh, part of it. And Marvo, I was just wondering if you have. Um, learn some particular skills during the uh, the production of the exhibition and are you using this storytelling skills um, in your current position as a researcher? Yeah, I think um, when you create such things, the main challenge is writing about something that you are invested in, in a way that everybody, even the ones who don't have any prior knowledge, understand it. Um, without making the text pages long. Um, so that was the biggest challenge we, we um, had to face as students who are used to writing 20 pages as an exam to hand in. And then suddenly you have to shorten to like 10 lines max uh, and really get to the essence. And um, yes, I am still using that today because um, in my current position, I am creating with two colleagues um, a large temporary exhibition on the uh, World War One cemeteries for the Flanders Fields Museum. Um, so not really in this phase, but in the next phase of our um, pro process, it will be very useful to do that again, to, to shorten the text for the exhibition to the real essence. Um, even though you have been invested in it, for, I am here for six months now already. So I have been reading nothing else on this topic. And the same was with the pill. We had seven months to create the exhibition. Um, and from day one, you start reading and reading and reading, and you have all this information. And then you have to put it together in 10 lines, which is a hard task, but it's really nice to do. And I, I, I think it's kind of fun too. <laughs> that is a very intense work, indeed. Um, I saw from the audience a question. Um, someone wants to know how uh, the interactive video was made. I think that's for the, the video that you were just showing. Um, the, um, the presentation. application to make the museum was called Art Steps. Um, and then to make the video, I recorded my, so you can view, make the museum, um, the virtual museum, and then you can put it in full screen and walk through it. Um, and I did that and I recorded myself on Zoom while doing the voiceover, uh, I walked myself through the museum and I talked when I saw a certain stop. Uh, and that's how I made the video. But the program to make the museum is called Art Steps. Thank you. So I think that was a question from Gaia Pinotti. So I hope uh, Gaia does we answer. 
Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, are we having more questions from the audience? Uh, if not, uh, let me just check the time. Oh, we have we have tons of time. Um, Tanya, I'm going to then ask again, uh, go to you now. Um, just uh, as a person that, uh, as I mentioned, I really enjoy listening to great storytellers. I don't feel that I develop enough skill in the storytelling uh, yet. So I'm always uh, fascinating, uh, fascinated. Uh, where do you get like inspiration, for example, to create the next post? How do you uh, make decisions on what to uh, communicate uh, to your audience next? So um, I'm extremely lucky in having a very large pool of uh, resources in where I can source my questions from. The first pool obviously comes from the audience. There is a lot of people that send in queries and uh, concerns that they have. And the second pool is um, stuff that I see at the hospital where I directly interact with patients and I see more questions in a direct medical setting where people are curious about diagnoses, how things develop, and um, of course, there's also questions that I've had growing up or my friends have had growing up or that we, you know, sit down and have a chat about and realize that there's something we've all had in common, but we don't quite know the answer to. So these would be my three main sources. Yeah, I, feel, I, I have a similar feeling that, uh, yeah, this is, this, these are the uh, usually questions that no one else wanted to answer. So uh, I saw, um, I saw one of your video where I think you were explaining uh, contraception uh, by using the metaphor of a Bollywood romance. I think that was uh, yes, it was <laughs> it was very nice. Uh, I really like that uh, you know how you try to relate you know the this complicated uh, well complicated. I mean uh, sometimes very um, very technical terms that you explain in you know like relatable uh, relatable way. Um, so is that something that you like, you enjoy this, this type of uh, connections to make to, for your audience? So medical school was quite intense. And uh, one of the things that made it easier was making up absurd stories to remember things. <laughs> and that has, that's been a skill that has served me very well, not just through medical school, but also in my content creation journey. I'm currently working on my book where I'm also using a lot of these Bollywood style metaphors to help not just um, understand these things, but also remember these things because there's, I don't know if you if you understand how periods work using a fairy tale, you will forever remember that as opposed to remembering the different cyclical pathways of progesterone and estrogen and how you know eggs develop and things of that sort. So um, definitely, probably picked it up from um, lots of different books I read. One of the things that has been very helpful in this is there's a Richard Feynman quote which says that you truly understand a subject once you can explain it to a five year old. So if you can simplify it to that extent, then you will always remember it. So it serves you as well as the person you're explaining it to. That's a very, very nice quote, I think, to, uh, for the end of the session. Uh, I see that we have uh, maybe one more question from the audience. Um, also to you, Tanya. Um, can you help us understand how you ensure your content is engaging with your audience? Um, I, what I normally do is every time I'm recording or filming something, I do multiple iterations of it. And then I see which feels the most entertaining because I feel like as long as edutainment um, is a part of enter is a part of education, it automatically becomes more entertaining and more engaging. Um, and yeah, uh, there's like, you have to go through different things. And also one of the best ways of making sure your content is engaging or your storytelling is engaging is inviting feedback and inviting questions, um, which give you an opportunity to 
improve in areas where people can give you feedback where you know i say i'm lacking in and also figure out if if you explain something well enough it will lead to more questions so it's also sort of very encouraging in that way that's um that's lovely um i hope that answered the question of i'm sorry i, I missed the name of the person that was asking it but i hope uh, I hope that answers your question. Um, I just I had one question that just popped into my mind and now it's lost. So I think we're gonna <laughs> I think we're gonna finish with that. Sorry. Um, thank you so much. It was lovely having you here. Thank you for telling us uh, about your project. Um, yes, I hope the session was um, inspiring to our audience. It was definitely inspiring to me. So uh, thank you for that. De Nederlandse ontwerpers Max Heijmans, Dick Holthaus en Ferry Offerman een modeshow ten bate van het Nationale Fonds ter Bestrijding van de Kinderverlamming. Het was de eerste keer dat deze couturiers gezamenlijk hun collecties toonden. Met tal van ontwerpen, zoals bijvoorbeeld deze namiddagtailleur, bewees het drie manschap zijn talenten, die ook in het buitenland reeds waardering vinden. Wintersport een goed hart toedraagt, is al druk aan het oefenen voor het komende seizoen. Bij gebrek aan besneeuwde bergen doet men dat in de landelijke omgeving van Overveen, vlak bij de uitspanning Kraantje Lek, waar het modehuis Lezer een vlotte show gaf van de nieuwste wintersportkleding voor de Nederlandse vrouw. seizoen nieuwe dessins voor en nieuwe modellen. En de Nederlandse confectieindustrie, die ook internationaal een steeds voornamer plaats inneemt, toont elk seizoen wat zij op dit terrein heeft bij te dragen. Dit zijn enkele sportieve mantels, bestemd voor het komende voorjaar, zoals binnen- en buitenlandse inkopers die te zien kregen tijdens de negende Fashion Week die in Amsterdam werd gehouden. De stoffen zijn over het algemeen vrij dik.
the pictures in school books as a source of inspiration and artistic creation, an awarded digital storytelling project. What is cultural heritage? According to UNESCO, heritage is the cultural legacy we receive from the past, we live in the present, and we pass on to future generations. Heritage is a source of inspiration for creativity and innovation that generate contemporary and future cultural products. Cultural heritage includes monuments, customs, traditions, ceremonies, arts and crafts, music, history, the natural environment, religion, science, artifacts with a diversity of values and social significance. Are books part of our cultural heritage? Of course they are. Books are artifacts written at a particular time for a specific purpose. They are living expressions of the values, knowledge, traditions and practices of the society they were born in and are a treasured part of our lives and memories. Let's take, for example, this textbook. It is the textbook with which children of the first grade in primary schools in Greece learned to read and write in the 1970s. The pictures in the textbook catch glimpses of the past, such as family life, professions, religious festivities, games, schooling and growing up. It can be found in the digital historical collection of school textbooks of the Institute of Educational Policy of Greece and is considered to be a national treasure. The ways in which we handle and store important books can affect how long they will last and will be available to pass down to future generations. In order to raise awareness of the importance of preserving national treasures, students make digital stories inspired by the pictures in the specific textbook. The students worked collaboratively, chose pictures, wrote stories, made storyboards, and created their digital stories. Then they took part in the international competition and won the first prize for creating nine digital stories inspired by the pictures of the textbook. Let's have a look at one of those digital stories that the students made. The Magic Book Once upon a time, there was a magic book which granted wishes. By writing your wish onto the blank page, it came true immediately. Nobody knows where it is hidden, and if you find it, you must not use it, because bad things may happen. Wow, that's a great story, Grandma. Tell us more. When your grandpa was still a child, he liked to run in the fields. One day he stumbled upon a stone. He looked closer and he saw that it was not a stone, but an old book with blank pages. He took the book to his friends and they decided each one to write a special wish on the pages. Mary wished for a doll. Suddenly, a doll appeared on her lap. Lena wished to get high marks at school. Suddenly, the school report appeared in her hands. Your grandpa wished for a kite. Suddenly, a kite appeared in the sky. He burst into laughter and jumped up and down with joy. Suddenly, a strong wind blew out of nowhere, transforming the children into birds. Your grandpa was transformed into an owl. Mary turned into a hen. Lena when she saw what was happening, grabbed the book quickly and threw it into the fire. Then her friends regained their human appearance. They were glad they managed to get rid of the magic book and decided from now on to rely on themselves in order to achieve their goals and wishes. What is the morale behind the story? Children are aware of the power of words and consequently of books in transforming the world around us. Our capacity to create digital stories with cultural heritage surpasses that of the physical world of paper. Cultural heritage has the potential to promote access to and enjoyment of cultural diversity and create a sense of individual and collective belonging. Create digital stories with cultural heritage and enter the festival competition. Thank you. Hi, I'm an oral historian from India. I document experiences of partition survivors of 1947, which becomes a monumental part of my curatorial lens. The central event is the partition of 1947, which carved up British Empire roughly along religious and political lines and uprooted more than 10 million people. 
I begin by conducting interviews with partition survivors. While interviewing, I started to wonder how the traumatic series of events was interpreted in Britain. I therefore refer to the only archive available that was capable of answering this question, the British newspaper reports. I concluded that what was life changing and traumatic experience for millions of people in India was reduced to figures in British sources. Moreover, I encountered various articles that praised the British officials for handling the situation well, which in my opinion was condescending. Partition was not just splitting of the subcontinent. It had a traumatic and disturbing psychological aftermath. From a holistic picture, I like to collect all the available information from every source. I have an emotional connection with every person I interview. I can empathize and understand their experiences, which makes the person being interviewed more comfortable. They usually end up sharing traumatic events that they might have mentally repressed for years. I would like to discuss one such story of a partition survivor who talks in detail about his migration journey and how it still haunts him till date. Anil, you've changed the name here, was trying to migrate with his wife from Lahore to Lucknow in India. They had a small dairy shop and an ancestral home that they had to leave behind with the hope of sh starting a new life. Anil's wife took care of the street dogs in their area. The event that made them migrate was when they woke up one morning to find all the dogs butchered because of the communal violence. They made the decision to pack whatever they can and leave within the next one hour. They started the journey barefoot with enough water to last two days. Within a few hours into the journey, they encountered raiders who demanded all the gold and valuables. But this period of divide and rule had made friends into enemies, so this wasn't enough. They started beating him up, tied him up, while the group raped and killed his wife. There are millions of life-altering stories out there ready to be heard and let the world know what really happened. It's about humanizing the data and showing the world these individual stories that haunted a whole generation, stealing away the life they could have led. The other side of my decolonizing research focuses on archaeology and how British colonialism may have been a setback to the field. The way that archaeologists decipher the meaning of a structure or object is shaped by their own context and frames of references. The approach of British archaeologists in India lacked the necessary local knowledge and understanding. So I feel many objects or data were misinterpreted. Here you can see the Amravati marbles that were taken to Britain by Walter Elliot in the 1940s. Oral history and interviews can provide narratives, social meaning, and context for the objects. Here you can see a coin issued by the British government in 1945. The hole in the middle signifies the economic issues the empire was facing, making them cut on the raw materials to issue coins. Therefore, I feel oral history becomes a great tool and source to learn about the general population and individual as opposed to general historical record of an event. Thank you. Welcome back. I hope everyone had a nice break and enjoyed the whole day and that you are ready for this last session, which is about the place on the internet where all the things cool and trendy are expressed and explained through art. This place is called Daily Art Magazine and our guest today is editor-in-chief of it, Kate Wojtak, who is an editor, writer, art historian, and PhD holder in art history, a traveler, traveling even at the moment, and a foodie. So she will tell us how to make art always relevant, cool, and how to show it in an interesting way. She will show different formats, uh, examples of articles, and if there are not enough secrets being shared and there, there is still time, my colleague Georgia will squeeze some more uh, during a Q&A question. And also the result of this conversation and a little feature of daily art is planned for within a few weeks on European Pro. So look, look forward to it, but for now, uh, enjoy the session and Kate, 
the floor is yours. Hi, hello, Alexandra. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Kate Wojcik. I'm editor in chief of Daily Art Magazine. And first of all, I want to thank you for including me in this incredible event. So uh, kudos to um, European Europeana uh, team uh, because you made the great work. And I'm super happy and very excited and proud uh, that I can today take you uh, to a very unique place, um, very unique place uh, on uh, internet, uh, which is called um, Daily Art Magazine. And um, it's the, I think, one and only like big online magazine about art and especially art history. Um, so let me first uh, tell you a few words about the background concept of the um, of daily art uh, as general. So uh, daily art magazine is basically a younger sister of uh, daily art app. Uh, what you can see here uh, are like a few screens from daily art app. Daily art app is already 10 years old and it's based on a very simple concept so our users uh, are getting every day uh, to their mobile phones or tablets a very carefully selected work of art one work of art but which is accompanied by a short story um, what is the mission is that we want to serve our users a daily dose of beauty and inspiration based on the genius and talent of great artists of the past. So there are like thousands or probably millions of works of art, which you probably won't ever see because they are like on the back walls of the provincial museums or packed in the storages of some uh, institutions. And what we do uh, in daily art is like uh, finding them, picking them and showing to you um, with a short story, which tells what is it, what you can see there, what is the meaning of this artwork and uh, who created it and so on. So it's very quick and very painless method of seeing something beautiful or striking every day and getting to know um, getting to know something new. Um, over the course of the years uh, in daily art, we developed some side projects uh, and side objects actually, gadgets. So what you can see on this picture is one of our um, weekly calendars, uh, but they are not just uh, plain calendars with a picture. As you can see here, it's uh, you have a painting or other work of art also um, also accompanied by a short story so you can learn something new. Um, so we also developed like courses on art history and many gadgets which are all with this uh, meaning of sharing a story. Um, but today's main character, so what I want to uh, present to you is, um, is actually Daily Art Magazine. And um, Daily Art Magazine was launched in 2016. Um, first, uh, as a quite um, decent uh, page called, called Daily Art Daily, then it developed uh, into, um, into a page which was more uh, like blog style. So we um, presented every day a new article on art and um, the articles uh, developed over this time, they got longer, they got more various and we found ourselves in a position that we decided that we want to have uh, like a bigger, richer website where we can um, share more content. And that uh, happened in the last autumn. Uh, in the late October, we presented the new Daily Art Magazine website, which, uh, was, which is more in a form 
um, of, a, uh, of a newspaper or magazine. So there are several sections. Um, there are much more content uh, published. So now we publish like even 30 to 40 articles a week, um, very various ones. Uh, and um, the page uh, or the website developed um, uh, through all these years quite nicely. Uh, we actually reached one and a half million page views and almost 800,000 um, users in the last quarter. And it's constantly growing, uh, which shows us that people are um, willing to read about art, to get to know about art, uh, which is making us uh, very happy and very inspired and willing to, uh, to create even more content. Um, what we know of, uh, about our audience, uh, they use it um, quite often for work or for school, uh, but also just for enriching the lives with something beautiful and meaningful. And um, that we know not only by statistics, but uh, mostly through emails, which we are uh, constantly getting from our readers. And especially uh, during the uh, pandemic uh, times, which were tough for us all, uh, we really got a bunch of thank you emails from people who said that uh, this, um, these stories on art uh, was, were uh, helping them to get through the hard times, which was super nice. We also know that uh, one sixth of the audience of the page are returning users which means that there are um, like over 16% of our readers who are frequent readers who come back to read the stories on uh, Daily Art. Um, Daily Art magazine is the place uh, where art history gains the voice it deserves. It's like our, um, uh, it's, it's like our main, um, um, main words for the magazine and uh, we are kind of unique on the uh, online uh, and publishing market because there are plenty magazines about art, but they're more focused on our market, on contemporary art, on auctions. Uh, and there are also magazines which are more in character academic or scientific, let's say. Um, so our idea is to obviously be based on knowledge, on facts. So we are carefully checking what we are posting, but uh, the main idea is to serve this content uh, lightly, that uh, to use not complicated language, to explain uh, not so common terms, uh, to explain backgrounds for, um, uh, for phenomenon in art history, which are not widely known. Uh, generally, our mission is to present art history uh, in the most compelling and fun way. Uh, what is also very important for us, and I would like to strongly underline it, is that um, we also try to escape the very traditional uh, stiff art history canon, which we were or most of us was raised uh, in. So this very uh, Western focused point of view. Um, so what we learn in school or even uh, in art history studies, I mean, it has, it changes now a bit, but it's still, um, still quite strong in many areas. So um, not to, uh, focus on Western art, on European, only on European art, on North American art, because it's mostly what is presented, but uh, to go out of it and to present um, to present the excluded areas. So like South American art, um, indigenous people's art, black people's art. Um, we are looking for themes uh, in Asia, in Australia. For example, we have an article, um, I, I bet you, most of you probably haven't heard that there, are, were, there was a group of uh, Australian Impressionists. There were always a, a strong um, Impressionist school in Turkey, for example. So that is what 
um, we are aiming for to uh, to have like a fresher, broader point of view on art. Uh, what is in, in included also here? It's um, female artists, which I will say a few words more in in a few minutes. And we also try to uh, help young and emerging artists uh, if uh, if it's uh, they create something uh, something uh, meaningful, something uh, good. We also want to um, share it on our side. So um, as I said, we have this uh, new website and the new uh, main page is much richer and much uh, broader than the old one. So we have there a few um, sections which I would like to talk about a bit now because it will show uh, well the areas we are focused. So the first one is the most um, is the most various one. So the section featured uh, shows uh, just new articles. Uh, we show it them. We show them, uh, or we feature them on the main main page for a few days, and there is uh, everything which doesn't strictly um, match our themes of the day, which I will mention in a moment. And there are like basic articles and history of art, but also uh, reviews of current exhibitions, a reviews uh, on books about art, about theater plays connected to art and, uh, and so on. Um, the next section I would like to present, it's a so-called long reads. And this is a place where we present longer stories so it's nothing which you will uh, scroll during your five minute work break, but rather uh, a nice um, read for um, a lazy Sunday morning uh, for something to sit down and uh, have a coffee and read a nice essay and a nice story um, about uh, art or art history. Uh, another section which is uh, pretty important to us and what I mentioned already shortly is women artists. So this is also quite important for us. And this is also important personally for me uh, because um, I studied history of art from bachelor to PhD uh, at three universities in uh, two countries. And what I remember um, from my studies is that there was not much uh, on women artists, especially before modern times. So um, I guess there were like three artists mentioned uh, in early modern times. So it's like, I was really for years convinced that art history is male, that there is not much more before modernity. Um, and uh, these years I spent in daily art showed me that there are like plenty of women artists who were uh, forgotten or erased as some say, and who are so great and so worth to feature. So uh, this is our big thing. This is something we really want to show. And um, it's not because of an idea, it's because it's totally worth showing. It's just great art. Um, just a quick off top, uh, I think the really great thing which happened this year on, in this topic is the Venice Biennale, because this year's main exhibitions uh, are really focused on uh, female art and they are simply great. So um, that is uh, what we strongly, um, we are strongly encouraged to show in, uh, in daily art magazine, the female art. And what's more, it's another uh, section which is very typical for us. Um, it's called like WTF art history. And there is everything which we found uh, funny and compelling uh, in, uh, in traditional art because um, sometimes people treat art history uh, with like super respect thing that it's uh, like um, very serious thing. And actually, if you start to browse uh, and if you start to 
look at certain way at things, there is like a lot of fun in this. And that's what we want to, uh, to show, uh, to encourage people to, um, yeah, to read, to get to know uh, more about art. So it's a section where we show articles on, uh, let's say, memes based on um, medieval uh, manuscripts, which I guess is a thing uh, during this festival. So you saw or you will see more on this um, through like a short film of Andy Warhol uh, eating a hamburger. Uh, to bizarre works of art like, um, I don't know, Golden Toilet, and obviously lots of cats and lots of food. Um, fun fact, um, we are a magazine on art history, but still if we, um, if we study the queries people are looking um, and uh, we are Googling and uh, then landing on Daily Art Magazine, uh, it's still quite a lot of them looking for uh, themes connected to nudes, erotics, and things like that. So from that, the world didn't change. Um, yeah, uh, taking, uh, turning it a bit um, more serious, uh, we also have uh, a feature which was thought to be for news. And we are not a typical uh, news magazine. We produce news rather rarely, it happens, but it's not um, our big thing. But we have this feature on the side. And a few weeks ago, when the um, outbreak of war in Ukraine uh, was a fact, uh, we uh, were wondering uh, in our team, uh, what can we do? Uh, to help in any way uh, through the magazine. And we've got that idea to use this feature uh, for uh, like broadening knowledge about art and culture uh, in Ukraine, about Ukrainian art and culture. So we changed this uh, breaking news into Ukraine special. And every day since uh, the war, war outbreak, there is an article connected to um, to Ukraine uh, in a daily art magazine, which we are quite proud about. Um, and now I would like to show the main uh, section of the magazine. It's a screen showing an example of it. And that is called like featured uh, story. And here we present every day a new theme um, and it is genuinely uh, connected to general daily art idea. So that every day you get a new content. In this case, in the magazine, it's like new subject uh, to which we connect several articles, uh, usually like two to seven. And I would like to give you a few examples. Um, which will show you what we are uh, featuring there. Um, we built extended long-term calendar uh, where we plan these, um, these daily subjects. And they are quite often connected to many special occasions uh, to, to several holidays. So um, a few days ago, for example, we had a, a featured story which was called uh, Viva Mexico Cinco de Mayo and that was obviously uh, connected to a national holiday in uh, in Mexico and we presented on that day uh, several articles on Mexican art. Uh, also uh, we are trying to celebrate uh, several holidays in various cultures so for example we had a theme uh, Islamic art treasures to celebrate the beginning of Ramadan. Uh, but we also um, use like more um, casual, unofficial and funny occasions and dates uh, and anniversaries. So uh, at the beginning of May, we, for example, had a, a theme which was called May the Fourth Be With You, uh, which was obviously connected to the Star Wars movies. 
And then uh, there we presented uh, two articles on classical art and Star Wars mashups, and also one on archetypes, which are which are um, mutual for uh, Star Wars saga and uh, well many classical artworks. Um, soon we will present a theme which is called female surrealists and their great imagination. Uh, which was inspired by uh, a current exhibition at the Peggy Guggenheim Museum in Venice. And that will be, of course, uh, focused on uh, female artists um, creating uh, in the surrealist movement, um, because there were like many of them and they were really, really great. Uh, but we also do um, subjects like, for example, all you need to know on Italian Renaissance. So it's like art history basics. So every couple of days uh, by entering Daily Art Magazine, you can learn on a certain um, for the art movement or art epoch. And then uh, you have like a uh, capsule themes connected to this main subject. So if it's Italian Renaissance, you would probably find an article on Michel Michelangelo or Leonardo, um, but also let's say um, about uh, Italian drawing in that time or uh, something more um, uh, like more weird, like for example, Mona Lisa uh, illnesses, because uh, there are plenty of studies uh, examining uh, what might have been uh, with her. Um, so another another example is um, symbols in art. So we also try to cover certain problems in art history, give some background, give some examples. Uh, so here for sure you would read, for example, about um, meaning of objects uh, in uh, uh, still lives during the Dutch golden age, let's say, because that's the thing. We, uh, we can show you a painting and we can tell you how many layers, how many meanings uh, is actually there. Um, yeah, we also like do, um, uh, do uh, featured stories on, on uh, for example, uh, genres. So um, like American light landscape in art where we show Hudson River School, for example, or uh, we have an article on, um, California landscapes, very nice one. Uh, and the last, which is worth to mention, is obviously uh, artists' birthday anniversaries, uh, which is also like a milestone for us in this calendar. For example, tomorrow uh, there is uh, anniversary of Salvador Dali birthday. So if you and if if you uh, visit Daily Art Magazine tomorrow, you can read. Um, several articles about um, various aspects of uh, Dali art. Uh, what we do more and what is important for us, uh, we take um, active part in celebrating a special month during the year. So like Black History Month, Women's History Month or Pride Month, which is uh, approaching. Um, and during this month, we try to uh, publish more on this particular subject. Obviously, we generally try to um, publish on these excluded areas, but we focus even more during these months to cover uh, to cover uh, the themes connected to the um, this these excluded uh, communities. So, a few words about our team. Um, generally, uh, every day we work now uh, in a four people team as a core of Daily Art Magazine, but we have extended group of uh, volunteer writers and uh, editors and proofreaders from all around the world, um, which is really great because uh, this gives us 
um, this enriched the whole editorial team. Uh, the, um, our writers uh, are, are coming from very different places, from different countries, from different cultures. They have their own point of views, but also, which is priceless, uh, a knowledge in um, uh, a knowledge which is sometimes uh, available only in certain languages. So we would be not able to easily approach it. And uh, and they have this. They have knowledge in language. They have knowledge in culture, and they can share it. So um, so that is really great. And it's um, we are quite often brainstorming on uh, on these subjects, both uh, ideas for articles and for um, and for daily stories. Um, so uh, that's really great because we have this calendar. I have a lot of ideas, but always the discussions are super inspiring, and uh, that's how many unexpected uh, subjects are uh, born in a way. So I would like to say now a bit more about, I mean, I would like to give a few examples of articles uh, we, are, um, we are presenting in Daily Art Magazine, which will uh, give you a nice uh, look into um, how we work, what we cover and so on. So the first example is on men in heels. It's an article starting with a, with a sentence, what do the Persians, Louis XIV and Johnny Cash have in common? And uh, it's a good example for a bit atypical theme. So that is what we are looking for. Um, it might be even a bit controversial and um, also, it's connecting. That's something we like to do. So, connecting history, connecting history of art, this uh, old dusty stuff uh, with uh, our times and our problems of today, and uh, it's also like this light way of presenting pretty important things, and like educating by entertaining. Um, and I think that article might be helpful in some uh, broadening of tolerant and more, more diverse uh, view on uh, things. Um, another example which I would like to show is this uh, one. It's an article about Artemisia Gentileschi, uh, an Italian uh, Baroque artist, uh, a really really great one, a uh, really talented one uh, with uh, who created um, a few um, really like timeless masterpieces, uh, but she also um, she also was like a rape survivor, so he had a really tough story uh, which uh, which is so important uh, today because um, she managed, back then in this very tough time for women um, go like against her times and fight for her rights. So it's a real Baroque superwoman role model we can look up today. Um, another uh, more, um, um, far more light example is this article. Uh, on the uh, unbelievable story of killer rabbits in uh, medieval manuscripts. And this is an article which is taught in a bit of a style of this horrible, miserable Middle Ages. I don't know if you remember these books. So it's, um, it's a, a, an example when we want in a funny way um, talking about something classical. So like Middle Ages, um, is a never ending source of inspiration uh, for um, appealing bizarre stuff um, that is uh, something special, something uh, that uh, I know you also like work on. And our idea is to uh, smuggle like facts about illuminated manuscripts uh, by, um, by showing it in this, uh, in this uh, appealing and funny way. Um, and that's a bit also in a case of the next article I would like to present on uh, Louis Wayne. 
And um, this is an article which uh, we probably were like refresh soon uh, because uh, there is um, probably a third about the film with Benedict Cumber Cumberbatch who um, which uh, just hit the cinema theaters um, a few weeks ago. And uh, yeah, maybe uh, someone after uh, watching that movie will uh, would like to um, get to know more about Louise Wayne. So we are serving with an information. Uh, what is also important here, it's an article about cats. Uh, we are in daily art, um, all cut, uh, cut lovers and cut owners, actually. So uh, we um, publish a lot about cats, and that is something which our audience usually love, loves. And um, but we are like um, not that one um, focused only on cats. So there are plenty uh, of articles or on other animals, uh, including uh, one on, let's say, sausage dogs of uh, famous artists. So everybody, I mean, uh, th there is something for everybody. There is something for dog lovers. There's even an article about hippos in uh, ancient Egypt. Um, uh, what is uh, this article is also a good example for what we do quite often. So we are um, uh, looking for uh, classical art or art history traces in pop culture. So we uh, managed to produce um, many articles um, on art in certain uh, cartoons, uh, series, uh, films. We have an article on uh, on art which appears in the Bojack Horseman or The Simpsons, uh, or what is shown on the Friends series uh, or on the movie Accountant. Um, we also uh, covered a subject. Uh, um, yeah, we also look up to like music videos which are showing art uh, with an example of Beyonce and Jay-Z's uh, song uh, made in Louvre. Uh, so if you, if someone is interested what is featured in this uh, music video, we have an article on this, like showing step by step uh, what is shown there and what it is. Uh, when we are um, actually uh, at uh, music, we also um, have this article, and that's uh, quite funny. We sometimes do articles uh, just on associations. So here's like Egon Schiele, uh, who in his self-portraits have the hand gestures, which uh, strongly remind us uh, on um, what hip hop uh, uh, artists um, are uh, actually, uh, yeah, showing on, on, on their pictures. Um, another example is this, and this is uh, something which I already mentioned. So a bit of erotic stuff, a bit of nudes always um, is quite popular. But what we want to do is that it's not necessarily straight. So we try to cover like non-binary artists, LGBTQ plus persons, uh, which is not always easy. Uh, we are still learning. The language there is changing all the time. But that is actually something um, we are a bit afraid of uh, presenting because of a possible negative comments. But what we usually get is uh, like pretty friendly help of how we can improve or how we can talk about these things that they are not harmful for everybody. So that's really nice. and. Another example is these 10 cocktails inspired by art uh, for arts drinking. And this is food and drinks, like everybody loves to eat, right? So um, did you know that there is a portrait of asparagus or wild strawberries and many paintings which are pure oats to cheese, mostly from the Dutch golden age. Um, so we cover many articles, uh, we, we produced many articles uh, about all food you can imagine, 
uh, depicted throughout art history, but also recipes inspired by art and artworks. And uh, yeah, this incredible list of cocktails uh, inspired by art, uh, I strongly encourage to use if you want to plan a sophisticated party. Um, what we else show in the magazine, it's uh, here's an example of uh, like, basics so um we always say in our team that daily art magazine teaches and entertains um so we have produced plenty of articles on basics in art history we call them 101 articles where you can learn about genres epochs styles artists and masterpiece stories and much much uh, more um one of other examples uh, it's something for impatient people so listicles here are fashion photographers uh, but uh, generally is the idea that these are articles very easy to digest very uh, um, quick to read so you can get to know uh, a lot and just scroll down only to enjoy the pictures or also read paragraphs or some paragraphs if you are interested in a particular picture to get to know more. And this example is on fashion photographers, but we also produce lists of things you have to know on certain artists or certain work of art, for example, Las Meninas and so on. And um, the last example uh, of an article which I like to show uh, that is uh, something more uh, serious, so it's something which is also very important for us. Uh, this is an article on colonial looting in Africa, so uh, it connects uh, to what I said about the excluded areas, but we also want to um, implement like new uh, view on old art. So uh, first non-European or non-Western focus point of view, and um, yeah, so present important themes with a fresh eye uh, and we are doing our best to follow uh, the important trends uh, in academic art history, but also just in the changing world. So we reacted strongly to Black Lives Matter. Uh, we are always looking to promote the big and important theme of the climate change. Uh, of wars, of art forgotten, of art from forgotten regions. We, for example, uh, interviewed a few artists from Beirut a year after uh, after the catastrophe there. So we wanted to show the very hard situation they have. Um, yeah, so we are trying to show more diverse, more sustainable, and generally more fair world of art, still in this easily accessible, uh, fun way. I mean, not always fun because there are like serious problems, but what uh, is important that is um, that is easy to uh, to access. And uh, well, there is a lot more uh, you can uh, find in Daily Art magazine. Um, and I want to encourage everybody to um, visit the site because I'm quite sure you will all find something special for you there if not cats then uh, something else and also we are very open for uh, collaborations so um, both if you are like a writer a proofreader and you would like to um, collaborate with us uh, on a longer time or just uh, publish a guest article, please uh, contact me. And uh, also as a general uh, in daily art, we are also having a long history of uh, um, really great partnerships with institutions. Uh, so there is uh, on the slide a bit more information on that. And I am very happy to provide more information uh, if you are interested so thank you and i hope you enjoyed um this quick uh, trip through daily art uh, magazine thank you so much kate that was um that was so inspiring um as editorial officer at europeana foundation that was definitely a lot for me to think about and reflect on there um i was really inspired by the variety of the content and um um, and also kind of how you how you make its relevance kind of um, really clear to audiences on an ongoing basis. 
So um, I have many, many questions, but first I would like, of course, to give the floor to the audience. So if you do have questions for Kate, please put them in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, and I can see that we do have a question for you, Kate, in the, um, the Q&A, um, which is how easy or difficult is it for Daily Art Magazine editors to find material that is sufficiently openly licensed? So is there a lot that you can't use or show because of copyright right boundaries? Um, yeah, that was the question around kind of uh, using the images to illustrate the stories. Um, yeah, we are very careful with that. Um, there is like a plenty of sources uh, uh, on the internet and that is great because during the last years, uh, there are going many digitalizing projects. So you have like a lot of resources which you can use. Um, obviously there is a public domain and it has a lot uh, there uh, there are museum sites and most of the museums and institutions are uh, pretty open to share their materials um, they uh, have press packs and so on but indeed uh, there sometimes there are some problems if we are covering like not that popular themes um, we use the right of quotation, so we always very carefully are citing the source and mostly linking it, and that over the years worked. So, um, I mean, during my three year time in Daily Art magazine, we had exactly three situations where someone uh, complained about uh, the pictures we posted. But in these three cases, we very easily solved it um, in a friendly way by emails. So it was two institutions who just wanted us to swap the pictures for what they want to present. Um, and once after explanation, they said, OK, it's, uh, you, you, you can have it there. So yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, like it's much uh, harder in, in the app because there the laws are much stricter but with the magazine it uh, generally goes quite smoothly we yeah we ask and we get it as i can say that fantastic thank you so much and um, i hope that answered um the question as well um a question that i had is about kind of helping people to navigate this wealth of content because kind of even some of the topics you've shared are so varied and so diverse um, and uh, kind of how you were talking about the way that you kind of group them by themes every day and help people navigate through kind of connections to, to maybe um, relevant holidays or commemoration days or something is really interesting. But I was wondering if you could say a bit more about how, how you approach that, how you approach grouping this content together to help people um, kind of navigate through it. Um, we have like a, a menu on the website, which is... Um, uh, we um, divided uh, themes uh, by um, by a few uh, categories. So there is, for example, regions where you can find um, articles from or uh, art from a certain uh, regions of the world. Uh, there is one on epochs and movements. So if you look for uh, like, let's say surrealism, uh, you will find articles there. There are like special categories. Uh, so um, like uh, what is quite popular in the early art magazine is the masterpiece stories. So it has its own category. Um, so that's the first thing, the categories. And then we use a system of tags uh, and there, um, that is uh, like a, a very helpful tool uh, to navigate more uh, in detail. So, for example, if you want to look, I don't know, uh, for articles on dogs, you will have a tag uh, for this. And these are on, under the article always. Great. Thank you so much. I think uh, from the chat, it will be important to be able to navigate um, straight, for, straight to cats and straight to dogs for sure. For cuts, there is a category. Yes, yeah. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much for your presentation and for answering these questions as well. And um, I think we are now moving to um, the end of uh, of the time that we have today. The gala has gone so quickly. So um, if you're ready, I'll be handing back to my colleagues, Alex, Douglas and Madavi to, um, to close the session. But thank you so much, Kate. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. bye. Thank you, Kate. Thank you all the speakers who shared their knowledge, their passion, and all the great tips today.
Um, it was great. We are very grateful for everyone who joined, also for social media reactions. Uh, we enjoyed it a lot. And we'll be back tomorrow with another day of the great program. Madavi, would you like to say a few words about that? We are absolutely encouraged by the response we have received and by the um, interactions that we've had with all of you today on chat and otherwise. Thank you for your very insightful, intelligent questions and for keeping the conversation going. And of course, we um, give a word of appreciation for all our speakers and a word is not enough. So all our appreciation for the speakers. Um, I'd also just like to say that on our Medium publication, there is a subscribe button. So if you um, add in your email address, you will get all the updates related to the festival and any upcoming um, associated stories or workshops that uh, we might host. And that is over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. I've absolutely loved it today. We've had so many great comments in the chat, some really smart Q&A. Uh, thanks again to all of our speakers, everyone who joined. If you joined for the full day, the full gala experience, respect, that's amazing. But if you dipped in for 10 minutes uh, with a quick coffee break or whatever else you were doing, thanks also for joining. Um, it's very much a, a menu that hopefully allows you to do that. And looking ahead to tomorrow, well, what's coming up? Um, feel free to share your thoughts, experiences uh, of today in the chat where we're taking a look. Um, but tomorrow we move forward in a, uh, in a new direction. So today we had creative workshops. Uh, we had tips around video storytelling, some brilliant examples of online storytelling with cultural heritage, just like we heard uh, from Kate with Daily Art. Um, Ad cats, your navigation, your website is a key takeaway from me. Um, I loved uh, the time that we spent with Thomas Bohm uh, around his work. And something that I really reflected on there was that the simple approach of people speaking straight to camera, sometimes appearing behind a wall and then gradually <laughs> moving forward was, was really cool. It's not always about how much money you have, how much technology you can throw at a project. Um, simple is good and can be really, really effective. And the conversations that we had from uh, the projects at KU Leuven and the Peel exhibition I thought was really interesting. Um, I, I really enjoyed that too. So what's coming up tomorrow? Well, let me give you a brief taster and an amuse-bouche. Um, first thing tomorrow morning, well, Madavi and I will be here again, and we're going to be talking about how to find great open access content because we I think we know it's challenging that you know you've got an idea you've got some inspiration to you know to, to make something um, to make an animation to make a story of any kind to illustrate an article or something that you're working on a picture for a blog let's say but it's not always easy to find openly licensed free to reuse download reuse no worries at all kind of content so with our museum and library heads on particularly, Madavi are going to take you on a little world tour of some of our favorite sources online to find great open access content and share those with you. We'll also be animating cultural heritage and who better than Alex to take us through a workshop around gift making. We're going to have a lot of fun tomorrow because that's followed up by medieval memes. Kate touched upon those, um, which are really great fun and, and fascinating, the details of those medieval manuscripts. And so tomorrow we're going to see um, how those can be created, shared um, and used in all kinds of contexts to tell all kinds of stories. So I uh, can't wait for that personally. And we also have a nice uh, contemporary uh, aspect tomorrow. We'll be talking about digital storytelling in the context of news and current events. Uh, we'll be hearing from Lakshmi Chowdhury at Splainer to see how she approaches that with her colleagues. And we will also be looking at education because that's a critical part, I think, of many of our work, particularly at the Heritage Lab, I know, and here at Europeana. So uh, our guests and colleagues from the education um, teams at Europeana will be walking us through how they approach things again sharing some nice examples we will 
travel to the Slovak National Gallery. And we're going to wrap up tomorrow with uh, a great session from our friends at The Curationist to see how they, uh, again, approach digital storytelling. How do they go about making stories? Where do they look for content? How do they review kind of audience experiences and listen to people on social media or on the website? So basically, it's another packed day of workshops, inspiration, and, and I hope a lot of fun and creativity. Um, so we can't wait for tomorrow. Thank you again for being with us today. Um, it's been a real blast. Um, so can't wait to see you tomorrow. Thanks.